right, the City Council for the City of Rollingwood will come to order Wednesday, April 17th, 2024 at 7 p.m. We'll start with roll call. Start with Ms. Brown. Brooke Brown. Alec Robinson. Kevin Glasheen. Phil McDuffie. Sarah oh. Hudson. Gavin Massingo being quorum present. We will move on to agenda item, well, to the public comment section. Is there anyone wishing to give public comment to items not on the agenda? Shanti Jay Kumar, 3309 Park Hills Drive. This is ad libbing, really, after what happened day before, day before yesterday. Just want to thank everybody. This is like grassroots level sewer water line. We were held hostage, literally, but we came through as a community. And I want to thank our public works, our police. I don't know, there was a whole host of people that came through. With including hazmat people and I mean I'm still overwhelmed I'm sure you guys are too so well deserved praise for everybody that took care of our community I mean we as a community have come together when we had the what is that the freeze couple of times when we lost but this was possibly one of the worst most scariest the thought of an ignition in the you know, igniting something of in the sewer lines, that was really, really scary. But we came through, and I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to all those people, staff, our, everybody, thank you. And Mr. Mayor, thank you also. And in addition, I'd just like to say that there are many people in this community who are new, and they really do not have um, mental picture of all our facility, I mean, you know, underground. They don't want the mental picture I have. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not the sewer line, but, and, but, but. And Chief and Ashley and Izzy. But, <laughs> I was on my walk with my regular Soul Sisters group that is a Rollingwood people. And many of them don't know why we have water issues, why we have all these problems coming up. And so I had to give a brief history of where we were and where we are and how now we have the you know, money. And so we have all these improvements coming down the line. But it might help to consider sending out some kind of an update on the water system uh, because people are concerned as to why we are running into these problems all the time. I just thought I'd be the conveyor of that information. So thank you again very, very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shanti. Uh, yeah, it's not on the agenda, so I won't speak to that particular item, but I think everybody's been updated, and I, and I too, would echo thank you to our staff. An excellent job. Uh, everyone came together in, in the heat of the moment and uh, did a nice job with it, so thank you for that. Okay, moving on to agenda item number two, presentations. Presentation and discussion on the quarterly investment report for the second quarter. Ms. Wayman, who do we have? Abel? We have our finance director, Abel Campos, here. Uh, currently, the city has approximately uh, $739,000 with tax pool. Most of it is uh, allocated to the general fund and wastewater fund. Well, waterfront does have some funds in there too, but the majority is uh, between those other two funds. Uh, yields have been somewhat stable this whole fiscal year. Uh, it's been averaging, average, averaging, I'm sorry, between $32 to $3,300 a month. And uh, the percentage-wise is about 5.3 percent has been the average yield, and it has stayed somewhat stable. So it hasn't changed much from the previous quarter. Any questions? Thank you, Abel. Or are there any questions for Abel? Hearing none, thank you, Abel. Um, with that, we'll close agenda item number two, move on to agenda item number three, presentation and discussion of the budget review for the second quarter. Uh, uh, currently, we're at 50% through March, and uh, on property taxes, uh, on the debt service uh, uh, collections, we're at 100% to pay for our debt service funds. On the uh, general revenue, we're at 96%, and so, uh, I anticipate we'll end up the year about 99% collections, which is what we've been averaging for the last X number of years, so we haven't changed much. On sales taxes, uh, it, uh, we've, the last two months have really been, collection-wise, have been kind of high, but 
I cautioned council that uh, a year ago we were kind of like that, and toward the end of the fiscal year it tailed off. So right now we're, we're looking pretty good as far as sales tax collections go. Water sales uh, through March were only at 37% of revenue we had estimated. Uh, and wastewater, we're at 53%, so we're doing a little bit better on wastewater as far as revenue is concerned. Uh, if you look at water and wastewater, those two funds, uh, big picture wise, uh, the revenues ha uh, <coughs> have exceeded uh, expenditures, but a caution council, when you look at the total revenue for water and the wastewater funds, uh, the loan proceeds for the meters have been booked there, so you need to back out about three hundred some thousand dollars on each of those funds to get a better picture of what revenue uh, has been collected each of those two funds but all in all uh, we're still in the black on those two funds uh, again big picture wise and uh, like I said before the debt service collections are we're at 100 percent so <coughs> as far as debt service payments go uh, we, I have no problems in terms of what we can do there with our responsibilities. Uh, any questions? Questions, Council? Looks like you got off pretty easy tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Abel. Appreciate Thank you. It. All right, with that, we will close agenda item number three and move on to agenda item number four, presentation and discussion regarding a potential bond issuance timeline for general obligation bond series 2024. Uh, this is an issue I brought before you um, last month, Council, as we just begin to sort of think forward, uh, think through, needing to probably um, start knocking out some timelines so that we can um, be prepared to issue the last portion of our bond proceeds for our, um, um, for our bond A. And I think we have uh, James Gilley from U.S. Capital Advisors here with us tonight to talk us through that timeline just so we can make sure that we hit it uh, and answer any questions that you have. James, you want to come on up and identify yourself, if you would? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, members of Council, it's a pleasure to be here again. Uh, my name is James Gilley with uh, U.S. Capital Advisors as the city's uh, municipal advisor. Um, as the mayor mentioned, uh, I was asked to come here and talk about a potential timeline for issuing general obligation bonds, a balance of uh, the utility uh, utility project. Uh, I think you have a, a timeline in your uh, in your packet. Do you have the uh, the, the other attachment maybe after this? <coughs> Thank you. That's it. Thank you. So, uh, you may have seen a timeline like this before when we issued the, the first installment of the general obligation bonds. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, this is a the, uh, the the purpose of this timeline is to be able to allow the city to have the, the bonds issued in time for uh, in, in time for you to be able to give it factor that next year's debt service into the tax rate during your budget setting process and as I understand the uh, that's required the, the county will need that information sometime in June or July so uh, the timeline suggests that we've already we've already begun preparing some of the offering documents um, the first uh, first big item is a, a rating call with standard and poors uh, we've actually just that tentatively scheduled for two weeks from today at uh, two o'clock. Um, as I said, we're, we've got the offering documents going. That those will go through several drafts with the uh, with the city's bond council and with our with our firm. Um, this timeline essentially estimates a or projects a bond sale, a competitive bond sale, on the morning of Wednesday, June twelfth, and. Assuming a successful bond sale, the results would be presented to council that evening for consideration of uh, the ordinance authorizing the issuance of the bonds. Um, and the transaction would close, if approved, that would close about 30 days later in July. So again, this the, the timeline, this is uh, the strategy behind it is to be able to get you 
get the debt, the, the bond sold and the debt service factored into next year's tax rate so that you don't have an interest rate, interest payment or come due before you're able to collect taxes to pay that, make that payment. All right, any questions for James? Yes, ma'am. Um, and I, I don't know if this is, if this is uh, uh, timely or not, uh, but the, as I look at the difference between the schedules for either a 20-year bond, a 25-year bond, or a 30-year bond, it looks like uh, the schedule for the 20-year, if we issued these as 20-year bonds, there would be a slight increase in the tax rate for year 2025, but uh, we would be down below the current tax rate by the following year, 2026. And so my question is, uh, if we were to sell these as 20-year bonds, is there a fair to middling chance that increases in valuation or other factors might allow us to um, cover the debt service without an increase in that tax rate over what we have currently? I, I think that's a reasonable expectation. The, uh, this analysis assumes a 3% growth in the uh, assessed valuation from this year to next. Um, historically, the city's been averaging, the past 10 years, the average growth rate's been 21%. So, uh, as you indicated, the for the 20-year amortization, we uh, estimate less than a quarter of uh, a quarter of a penny increase. Um, the debt service in this uh, is is overstated a bit, so the interest rates are trying well, to build in a little bit of uh, yeah. conservative assumption. So, um, we certainly hope the results will be better than this, uh, but there's just you know some volatility in the market. So. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Mayor, when are you thinking the council will need to decide on the structure of the bonds? Uh, probably next month would be sort of the last opportunity that you would have to sort of give some advice <coughs> to the council as to what your preferences would be to, uh, to James and uh, capital okay. advisors. There's not really any action to be taken other than that general direction of what our preference would be for when they go to bond sale. Okay. What, one other question. Is there... Uh, a difference in the date on which these funds, these bonds could be refunded under the 20 year versus the 25 or 30 year? Is there, is there a, or is there that a set date? We typically uh, look at a, uh, the market is generally accepting of a, a nine year call feature. Okay. So. Um, Regardless of the length of the bond? Uh, yes, that's right. Okay. Yes. All right. And that's just the market is generally accepting of that with that any type of penalty on much penalty on the interest rate so okay. all right thank you hey James other questions yes sir mr. Plushin If we were to, uh, if we were to place a some type of call feature on the bonds maturing prior to the ninth year, right, um, um, we could. It's possible we could we could estimate that, try to figure out what kind of what kind of impact that would have on the, um, on, the on the on the yields. But in experience, you think it kicks the yields up by twenty basis points, or do you have any idea? I'd say it'd be, it would be, a, there would be some hit to the interest rates. It's, it's hard to, it's hard to say, but especially since, uh, um, you know, the yield curves is kind of inverted at this point, the sh uh, short term, short term yields are, uh, there's, you know, it's a, the curves a bit flatter. So I, I would say that it, it's difficult to say, but, um, it certainly could be in the order of a 20 basis point effect, possibly more. If that's yes, that's gen our general recommendation. Unless the unless council has you know, direct Glish otherwise. Mr. Glashine, if you'd turn your microphone yeah. on. Oh. Yeah. Sorry, took okay. a new feature. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. That was all. <laughs> Good <So> ending. <laughs> 
And uh, James, I actually just, I, one question I just want to clarify. So our next council meeting is May 15th. Um, based on the schedule, I see that we have final comments due um, on the second draft of the bond documents by May 20th. If we were to get some direction at the May 15th meeting regarding um, the term of the, the, the sale, would that um, be enough time to get that those documents updated by May 20th? Yes, I would say that would be pretty much the, the drop dead date. That would uh, you would have to revise the uh, yeah, we'd have to re revise the, the documents to reflect the change in the amortization schedule. But okay. And you wouldn't would you need to know when do you need to know what council would like to do in terms of twenty twenty five thirty. That would be, um, ideally we'd like to know as soon as possible, but I think that if, if council decided that it, it, had, it wanted to make an official decision on it, um, that May 15th would, would be pretty much the last date. Um, right around there, we'd have, to, we'd have to work to get all the documents updated and to, to reflect, as I said, the, the change, in, uh, change in structure. If, um, if there was a general consensus on what the desired maturity would be, um, we could certainly set it up that way, and of course, council could deliberate and make sure that they, um, you know, selected the right maturity. So, in a perfect world, you would you would know that no later than next month. But do you have to know it next month, or can you still bring them back something to make once they actually approve? I think that that would be the, the last date, that council meeting in, in May, because um, I said we ha we need to we need to update the documents. We because you can't go to you can't go to market with all three options. Correct. You have to go to market with exactly what you're doing. Correct. Okay, that's what I need. Right. Question. Um, yes, sir. What, I might have missed it, but thank you. <laughs> I might have missed it, but what do you recommend between the twenty and thirty? Or well, uh, it it looks like. You know, as was discussed before, there, there could be very little to no impact on the tax rate. Um, and if, if you were able to sell, sell the, the balance of this, uh, the bonds for this project, uh, not increase the tax rate and save on interest instead of borrowing for longer than you need to, we estimate that between the t 20 and the 30 year could be as much as an additional half, over half a million dollars in, in uh, debt service of the life of the So the bonds. 20 is what you're recommending? I think yes, that would be. Okay. If I was sitting over there, that would be my recommendation, and I think it would also have better marketability mm -hmm. to the market. Um, the short, shorter term. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think it would also result in better pricing for the city, for having a 20-year versus uh, the 30-year. So 20-year with a nine-year call or no call. It's not very much money to do a call and reissuance. No, that's right. Uh, we always. Uh, Usually recommend a, a call with, uh, with bonds such as these that are going out beyond, you know, 15 or 15 years, because um, it's always possible that this could be combined with another issuance mm -hmm. and achieve That's debt true. service savings. So that makes sense. Yes, ma'am. I, th I think Alec had his hand up, but mm -hmm. just one brief comment. What I noticed in the schedules is that the debt service that we have on the books currently will reduce significantly by 2028. Yeah. And so uh, I, don't see a, I don't see a situation where we get ourselves in a pinch from selling these bonds at 20 year. Mm -hmm. uh, it goes from, um, uh, let's see. A million uh, five in 2027 to a million two in 2028, and the the added debt service from these bonds is in the range of the 110 million, uh, 110 thousand. So, I think we've got wiggle room within a couple of years. And I think that would, space, yeah. and, and I think that wiggle room will would still be there even after we come yes. with the with the bond B package, which is another two and a half million, so. Okay. Alec? Yeah, I was just gonna make a comment on that. It sounds like the schedule like works and then next month, it, it seems like there's enough time, but I was just curious, like if it did slip a month, I mean, is there any any uh, 
sort of padding in this? Like, cause I, cause we don't usually set the rate. I didn't think until like September. Like, do we need to have? <coughs> you take it it's the yeah, it's the county, so we have to give them uh, what you know our our information, so they can do the calculation on the tax rate that we they then provide back to us to set the rate. Um, and I believe they have a deadline of early July. July July 7th is okay. when they need that information by. So that's why we had to had to kind of step on it a little bit. Okay. So question, just out of curiosity, couldn't we just estimate the rate if we wanted to? Because it's going to be a pretty narrow range of variability. We talked about that, and we we don't believe that's um, an allowed <coughs> option. Is that correct? Yeah, it, it seems to me that different counties treat this different different way, and Travis County seems to be kind of a stickler <coughs> in terms of okay i was just curious i mean i know we need the money to pay for the bond package anyway so it's not like there's any way we can delay all this stuff right right anyway i was just curious well if it's helpful if you guys do you want to try to get a straw vote tonight? yeah that's what i was good that's what i thought we would do is kind of get a straw poll get some directions so james pay attention i'm gonna try to get you some direction here um and then if if council sleeps on it for 30 days and just wants to make a change we could but i think if we could give him some direction of what because it won't really come back for you for it an action until he goes to market comes <coughs> back and then you accept the, the sell so are you sort of leaning toward 20 or i'm leaning toward 20. okay how 20. 20. 20. i agree 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. looks like you're unanimous leaning toward 20. <laughs> <laughs> Very official straw poll. Very official straw poll. <laughs> <coughs> that no action was taken off. But um, does that give you what you need? It does. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, thank you, Council. And I think that concludes. Did we miss anything, Mr. Wayman? Okay, I think that concludes agenda item number uh, four. We will move on now to agenda item number five <coughs> update on the water CIP packages one through four and drainage projects. Uh, um, <coughs> I think Izzy is here. We can. Uh, this, happen, uh, this evening, you want to come up and I'm not going to make you do the whole thing, but I'll <laughs> have leave? you available so we can tag team this. But um, thank you, Mayor. Yes, sir. I saw the look you gave me from the back of the room. <laughs> um, so we do continue to proceed with the water CIP packages one through four. I think we're making some good progress. Uh, we're about two hundred thousand and two. Um, the the draws so far um, I think we've got another big one coming and, th and they will continue to ramp up as we go forward we're making good progress on the um, the cul-de-sac projects um, I can attest to that at least on mine I, they're doing some nice work I've been closely monitoring my street and I know that they're making progress on the others do you want to give us a little bit of color on, on that Izzy? sure the last of uh, the cul-de-sacs that they're working on right now is in Wood Cove and they did actually already did the tie-in onto uh, Timberline Drive. And for the next week and a half, they were going to go ahead and start uh, cutting that concrete street and start um, laying the pipe. But other than that, um, Westgate and Ewing, Jeffrey Cove and Southcrest, they're all on the new line now. They've actually switched over, running off the new line. The um, Inwood and Jeffrey, no, sorry, Inwood and Timberline Ridge, they're waiting for Inwood Cove to finish, and they're going to go ahead and do the um, disinfection of the new line, and then wait for the back t back tees to come back. And once they do that, then they'll go ahead and switch over to the new line. And it seems like they're moving their crews back and forth pretty seamlessly that they're seems correct and they're bringing in other crews uh for instance right now they're uh going through and backtracking and doing the curb repairs i noticed that yeah and yeah so they're bringing other they're bringing their concrete crews just for that all right any other <coughs> questions for izzy on on that is there like a sorry is there like a, a project plan somewhere like like where the lines are going to go like which i mean like by date like you know like okay this month we're here and then next month it's it's going to be you know like a, a schedule yeah, yeah like a schedule is there it? there is a, that schedule again depending on how because they will they are uh they do get behind in some uh parts of that schedule just because 
they're digging and they don't know what's they're running into rock you know or mm -hmm. that old concrete that's on inwood cove it's a lot thicker and a lot older than, than what they anticipated but that changes but for the most part they're on track and uh, there we we can go ahead and uh if if yeah, yeah. We so we do have uh, currently a, a schedule on the website, and we'll okay. make sure that's the most updated one, and we'll um, share that with the group. But we we're trying to they're they're sticking pretty well to the schedule. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, because I just had like a couple of residents ask me about uh, where the uh, schedule was and if it's on the website. That would be yes, it awesome. is. <laughs> it sure is. We try to keep it on the front page. Okay. Other other okay. news articles don't pop in. So. And we're trying to. Um, I think we've worked out a few. As, as was designed, I think we worked out through some bugs. We've got kind of a good standardized door hanger uh, system that uh, Izzy's crew goes through before we hit an area, and um, I think we're we're working pretty good on, on all of that. Um, obviously, there are a number of boil water notices that are required with, with these projects as we roll through. I know it's inconvenient, but if you can help us just spread the word and stick with us, it won't last forever. But... Um, that, that's what most of those boil water notices have and been about lately. Being patient with the back tea samples that we're waiting, because a lot of times <coughs> that's on the lab and we'll have to wait on them to say, you're good to go. Mm -hmm. yeah, but we're trying to keep them informed and I think we've sort of have a standardized system of well, what, two weeks prior to once we get go new into an area, we're trying to do the door hangers and that sort of thing. So right, uh, and then we do uh, I believe two days, 48, hour 48 hours at least, usually the week the week before, so usually closer to 72, but a call and or a rave and a door hanger saying what day we're going to shut your water off between what times, and then that a boil water notice will follow, and then we do the door hanger when the boil not notice is. And the tie-ins, we're trying to do them on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, so then that way that gives us ample time to hear back from the lab and not wait mm -hmm. over the weekend to see if, you know, we lift the uh, boil water notice. So we're still continuing to perfect it, but I, th I think we've, we're getting close to as good a process as we can have, even though it is, it is always going to be somewhat inconvenient. But. Mm -hmm. And another exciting uh, part of the water, we have officially got our permit turned in from Google Fiber. So they are, have committed to coming in during our, pazing, our phase, phase for paving, paving phase, that's hard to say. Um, so they'll be they'll be phasing their project as well, and so we we do expect to work a little bit with them to make sure that that happens. So we're hoping it's still within the same couple weeks, but we really are excited to get them in when they need to be, so that way we don't have to cut up our streets at another time, which we Good we work. don't want to do. Yes, so um, so that's kind of the update on the CIP in terms of the two drainage projects. We continue to make um, some progress, slow slower than we would like there. Uh, the Hubbard Hatley drainage project, we uh, think I told you that we had um, our key, the key easements that we have had to have to move forward with the project overall. We got those uh, in place just in the nick of time before, um, before we went with AO services. But good news, we also believe that we are now on the verge of getting the two remaining easements that were not necessary, not, not necessary to move forward with the project as a whole. <coughs> um, but are necessary to be able to do the whole project as, as it's designed. Um, and so we, we've been working with two of the homeowners in that project area, um, the, the two original properties that caused, the, that caused us to have the whole regional approach, and I think that we are close to, to being able to say that we're going to be able to acquire both of those, um, those easements. On the Nixon Pleasant drainage project, we have made um, some incremental progress. Texas Gas has completed the, their necessary relocations of their um, of their gas lines that are located in the street. Austin Energy has completed their pole placement and removal, um, and so we're happy about that. We had had months ago or over a month ago now submitted the TCEQ permit that's required for both of these permits. Uh, there's a 30-day comment period that has now uh, lapsed, so that's that's good that we made it past that. We have not received that TCEQ permit yet. Uh, we're kind of continuing to press them. Um, K Freeze's experience uh, has been that typically once it clears the comment period, um, that rubber stamp comes pretty quickly from TCEQ related to the TCEQ permit that we have to receive for these. Um, 
and we're going to continue to press them, but uh, we don't have it back yet. So as soon as we get that, we can start moving on, on both these projects. Anything else? No. And that's your CIP and drainage project update. Any questions? Okay, hearing none, we Thank will. You. Yes, yes. Thanks. Thanks, Izzy. Uh, moving on mm -hmm. to agenda item number six, updating presentation regarding pickleball noise data collection. Uh, this is just here for your information, council. I know we've talked about this issue in the past, and, and it's not my intention to um, cause us to talk about it at great length this evening. Uh, but we have, uh, there was there was some confusion about the data, and so I asked uh, PD and, and staff to, to do two baseline readings for us, um, one just ambient noise and the other at, at different levels. And then we also staged a, a, a bit of, a, of an experimental uh, pickleball play one morning, and we have those um, readings for you as well for your information. So that's there. Um, and if you have any questions about it, we're happy to answer them. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have one question. Um, the Where was the 250 feet spot? Chief? Are various spots at 250 feet or just one spot or? Just one spot. So it actually was closer to uh, Nixon. Okay. So downhill from? Yes, ma'am. I, I guess this is from Mr. Logue's property. Correct. Okay. All right. Yeah, I asked them to do them sort of in the same spot to just give you all a reading as to what they were in the specific spots. Um, and how many players per court were there? I understand there's two courts in play, but how many players? There's eight. There were eight. Were there eight? There, yes, that's correct. That's four on okay. each court. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Sure, come on. Sure, come on up. Glenn Harris, 3012 Hatley. Uh, first, I would like to say thank you, officers and city staff, for taking noise measurements. I recognize that this effort was conducted with objective goals and to ensure that the city's legislation is reasonable and enforceable. Um, I have an additional question about the measurements, which is the measurements that were taken at the property boundary. Could I ask which boundary that was, please? Yes, that, that was actually taken at, at your property line. With, Okay, at the street, on the curb, at my property line. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks no, for that no problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'd like to make some points about the data, and I would first like to make it clear that I'm not trying to nitpick the data or criti be critical of your efforts. I'm appreciative of the effort to make this objective and reasonable. I do think taking background noise level measurements in the street means that there's a higher component of street noise level in that background measurement than there would be at other property boundaries, such as a side yard or a backyard. Uh, I also would say that there is a sloping nature of that lot, and at that corner at the curb, the court level is actually below ground. So pickleball noise doesn't travel well through the earth. And lastly, as officers know, and everyone who's been on that court knows, there's a very tall reflective wall at the west end of the court and a half wall at the north end of the court. And that pushes all of the sound in the direction of my property and the direction of the properties on Pleasant Drive. So if as part of the discussions of this data, if there is a need for future measurements, I would like to re-invite the officers to please take measurements from my property, uh, the side yard of my property, that is the open end, the east end of that court, and even from my balcony, uh, which is closest to the court surface level. Um, Next, I'd like to reemphasize what has been presented to the City Council in meetings concerning the unique nature of pickleball sounds. There is an element of the problem that isn't simply captured by decibel readings, and that is the overall motivation for low decibel limits specific to pickleball. The best summary that I found in the literature that's already been presented to the City Council is this. The high-pitched pop sound made when a plastic pickleball hits the paddle has been measured by noise control experts and they agree that the pop is categorized as a highly impulsive sound because it starts quickly and dissipates quickly. This short burst is the key component in what is causing noise issues. Additionally, 
The impulsive pickleball pop sound is usually between 1,000 and 2,000 hertz, which is close to a human being's most sensitive hearing frequency range. What that means is we hear a pickleball sound better and from further away than other games with a softball and a stringed racket such as tennis. So I'd also like to proactively address the city council members and city staff if you're considering changes to the current ordinance based on this data, if that is a possible future action, I'd ask that you heed the experts' advice. A maximum noise limit for noises associated with pickleball play of three decibels above background noise level. This three decibels above background recommendation comes from Bob Unitic, and I'd like to remind you why the source of that recommendation matters. He is a retired engineer. He is a university professor. He is a USA Pickleball ambassador at large. He is a USA Pickleball certified referee. And he is the founder of Pickleball Sound Mitigation, LLC. He has become the go-to source for information on pickleball noise. So this recommendation of three decibels above background noise as a maximum is based on a balance of what neighbors can tolerate and what properly sound mitigated pickleball courts can achieve, what is acceptable and what is achievable. Lastly, if the decibel measurement seems altogether an untenable enforcement approach, there is the alternative of a special use permit, which requires a professional acoustic study and is completely analogous to how we require a professional drainage study for construction projects. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. Um, any questions? Question, sure. Has there been any um, effort to? Uh, oh, microphone. Microphone. Thank you. I'm going to just leave it on. <laughs> Have there, has there been any effort to put up any sound mitigating structures around the pickleball courts that you live next to? Not that I've seen. Uh, there has been no, no visible evidence of that. I know Mr. Logue and some of his players mentioned in several meetings that. We're investigating that. I've seen no concrete activity around that. Okay. Have they been playing? Play has been extremely minimal. Uh, the day of the study was the first play that I've noticed. I think that is related to the uh, notice of violation that was delivered to Mr. Logue in January, I believe. <clears throat> and. I'm just curious, what would you think about if the limit was, and I, and I don't know that there's any changes being considered to the ordinance, I don't really expect any, but um, if, if it was changed to no more than, f right now it's two hours a day, I believe. That's correct. Um, if it was also limited to um, four players at a time, do you think that would, is the noise still gonna be too loud at your house, in your experience? In my experience, that would make a difference. And I also think that's consistent with what a residential mm -hmm. pickleball court should be. Anything more than one court becomes an athletic club, which is the usage model that we saw. Well, and that's what I was thinking was if these noise limits effectively ban pickleball in Rollingwood, I don't think we intended to do that. But even if we do the three decibels, I mean, it gets, you know, instead of a, a noise-based control, if we went to if we changed it to the four players, do you think that would be sufficient for your situation? I do not. Yeah. My property is within, my bedroom windows are within 50 feet of that court, okay. of that court surface, which is very reflective. I know that when they play, they try to play on one of the four courts <clears throat> closest to Mr. Logue's residence and furthest from mine. But that wall, those reflective surfaces, that court, the sound bounces right into my bedroom window. Is there any kind of fence or a wall there between you and them? I haven't looked at that site for specifically. There is a chain link fence on that end with a uh, semi-porous vinyl sheet, which is not for sound purposes, but is for sunlight purposes to make the ball, the tennis ball primarily distinct, distinct because Tennis is played in that direction, mm -hmm. and so they wanted a green background to make tennis ball more visible. Mm -hmm. It is not a sound mitigating product. It is a, it is a sight product. Right. Okay. And what do you think about, like, um, a standard wood privacy fence? Do you think that would have much impact? I know it's speculating, mm -hmm. but just... I think we need to be cautious about a fence surface because if it's 
reflective is going to push the noise in somebody else's direction and you're going to be seeing somebody else up here every every mm -hmm. month yeah but it's not right outside their window either that's part of the problem here so. mm -hmm. yeah there's there's two primary surfaces that are used for pickleball noise mitigation there's yeah. a reflecting surface and there's an absorptive surface mm -hmm. i think uh, in this based on all the literature i've read given the close proximity of those courts to neighboring residences an absorptive surface is, is what would be recommended by a professional to mitigate the noise. And is that a product that's overlaid like a wood fence or is that a padding that's put up between metal poles or how's that typically look? It's, it's a padding and it's heavy. So uh, the cautions that I've read on, on product websites say that if someone just drapes their chain link fence with this product, it's likely to fall down. The wind's gonna, it's gonna be, catch the wind, it's a heavy mass, it's coming down. It would take a significant effort to reinforce and build it properly. What okay. if they what if they put that on the on the concrete walls? On the what walls? On, on the, the reflective on the, concrete. On the, on the concrete walls. So I think that would make some difference, but uh, there's still that leaves my end of the courts completely <laughs> open, and and for the people on Pleasant Drive, also completely open. Right, but as an initial effort that would not cause the problem of the weight on the other um, yeah. fence on your end, and it might help prevent some of the reflection of the noise um, to your property as well. I agree it might. I think typically what happens when uh, noise mitigating products are installed is that the company does a study to understand what is feasible at the site and what is practical and what is a good use of the court owner's resources sure. and that's out of my control <clears throat> sure thank you I, I had a question for police chief so the the decibel readings during pickleball play that was with quiet paddles or do we know anything about that or was that with because there's old school versus the quiet paddles I'm right I mean with we just asked that they uh, we didn't ask them to use a specific paddle okay. it's just the paddle that they used um, we did schedule this play to, to occur for an hour. That's how, that's why we took just different readings at different. I'm assuming times. it was probably the quiet paddles, given the fact that they said they solely adopted the quiet. Yeah, paddles. I would assume so too, because I think that that they're definitely trying to. Correct. Um, okay. Be cooperative. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Mm -hmm. Any questions? All right, uh, hearing none, we will move off of agenda item number six and move on to the consent agenda. I will entertain a motion. Uh, move approval of the consent agenda. You have a motion to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. You have a motion by Ms. Brown, a second by Mr. McDuffie. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Being five ayes, no nays, motion carries. Thank you, Council. Moving on to agenda item number 12, discussion and possible action to set a joint public hearing of the City Council on Planning and Zoning Commission to consider proposed rezoning of all properties currently zoned professional and business office district C1 and business district C2 to commercial district C to support the proposed amendments to the code of ordinances pursuant to the recommendations in the city's comprehensive <coughs> plan for the commercial corridor. I'll recognize Ms. Wayman to explain this one. So at the last city council <coughs> meeting, the city council voted to set this joint public hearing for the actual text amendments to the code um, in support of the comprehensive plan. Uh, th what this does, this also adds to that same public hearing, the uh, additional rezoning of properties that are currently C1 or C2 to uh, C. So this is the kind of the second part. We'll have two public hearings at that joint public hearing separately. Um, this was just one that had not, the council had not specifically authorized this public hearing. So we do need a motion for the city council to establish that. It has already been noticed um, that way. So the notice already included both public hearings. Um, we uh, clicked to this one just a beat after we had sent those out, uh, along with a small date correction that we have also sent a correction out for. But um, so this would just allow us to have both of those public hearings on the same day. And so we are requesting that the city council set that joint public hearing for April 24th, 2024 at six o'clock PM. It's basically just cleaning up what, what you'd already approved. So. Right. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I move approval to set a joint public hearing of the city council on planning and zoning commission for Wednesday, April 24, 2024 at 6 PM 
to consider proposed rezoning of all properties currently zoned professional and business office district C1 and business office district C2 to commercial district C to support the proposed amendments to the code of ordinances pursuant to the recommendations in the city's comprehensive plan for the commercial corridor. You have a motion, is there a second? Second. You have a motion by Ms. Brown, a second by Ms. Hudson. Is there further discussion? And so before we take action on at the hearing. Yes. Um, we have to actually adopt the change to the code. Right. To just have one commercial zoning code before we would need to rezone anything. Right. This would allow us to have both of those public hearings on that first day. So that way, at the end of all of it, you could just proceed with the rezoning. Right. Um, and then that way, if, obviously, if the amendments don't pass, then the rezoning wouldn't pass either. And That's we don't good. need to have the hearing. <laughs> right, True. but if we didn't have it now, we would have to re-notice for it and go through the noticing. Right, I'm, sure. I, and this makes perfect sense. Okay. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just making yeah. sure that Everybody's we understand the, the, the logistics and it's like, yes. this is not necessary <coughs> if we don't approve the change right. in, the, in the zoning code. That, exactly. is, that is correct. Okay. And Thank question, you. Yes, do you expect this to be a quick ministerial action next week? My, my wife has dinner plans. I'm just curious whether I should RSVP. I think Councilmember <laughs> Brown can speak to that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's approximately 52, 56 pages of code change. So mm -hmm. it will not be a quick ministerial act. The hearing that's set for next week though will be an overview of what those changes are. It won't be an action item for next week. Right. What the um, Comprehensive Plan Committee will do is to walk through those changes for planning and zoning in the City Council okay. and get comments on it. Then there'll be, subsequently, there'll be two public hearings before planning and zoning and two public hearings before this Council, before any, at which action could be taken. But there won't be action at that meeting. And we're going to do all those as joint hearings, is my understanding, right? Uh, no, just the just, just the hearing this one. next week is okay. a joint hearing. Then there are separate hearings before P and Z to get their recommendation for uh, for the council, right? And then for council action on that recommendation. Thank you very much. Okay. That was very helpful. Okay, for we'll see a lot of each other. Yes, I will be I will be <laughs> RSVPing with my regrets. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Any further discussion? Uh, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Being five ayes, no nays, motion carries. Thank you, Council. Moving on to agenda item number 13, discussion and possible action on a recommendation from the CRCRC and Planning and Zoning Commission regarding building height, uh, building height measurement and related considerations. Uh, recognize Ms. Wayman to open this item. Uh, you will see in your packet the recommendations that came straight from the CRCRC at their March 18th meeting. Um, they have been working really hard on these recommendations for building height and they submitted them to the Planning and Zoning Commission <coughs> on April 3rd, 2024. Um, there they were approved. So what comes before you today is we've considered it a, a, a recommendation from both CRCRC and Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, and we have uh, Brian Ryder here Alex Robinette and I believe also Jeff Marks from CRCRC to explain uh, any of those changes and or the proposed recommendations and uh, answer any questions. Well, one second. If we have room, Alex and I will tag team this a little yeah. bit. Um, I'm Brian Ryder, 2906 Hatley since 1985, which is many years um, in the past. I'd like to point out that our committee, which has been meeting twice a month, uh, for some time now, um, is composed of Jeff Marks and Dr. Jay Bevel, uh, who have, have recently had experience dealing with our codes, um, Duke Garwood, who's not here tonight, and Alex, who are trained architects, who have also had experience in dealing with our codes and, and in building things in Rollingwood. Dave Bench, who's not able to be here tonight, is our executive uh, rounder-upper and whip cracker uh, who keeps us going on all of this. Um, I think you all know that we did a broad assessment in the neighborhood, a, a poll if you will. Uh, each of us got out and handed out hundreds of, of cards and got back uh, responses by uh, email of 
what the uh, uh, citizenry wanted uh, and thought about this uh, process of considering changes to our uh, building codes. We found out, uh, we got the, and assessed the, the boxes that were checked, but we also found out that we live in a neighborhood of very intelligent, articulate, and assertive people. <laughs> because in addition to the check marks, we got, what, 2,200 written comments that we sat down and worked through to see what those really meant and reflected in addition to the check marks. And Alex will be able to talk more about that. Um, we've been through the process for several weeks now, for months now, of looking at that, of hearing from neighbors informally and some formally. Uh, there's records of emails that we've received on the, on the website uh, to deal with issues that people want to seem to deal, or seem to want to deal with uh, about our uh, building codes. And our draft, our proposal that we present to you tonight, many pages with some drawings and hope that they're hopefully explanatory of what we're trying to accomplish, um, is the, the working process result of that. We're not done. We also have uh, issues that we want to deal with about um, solid, long, solid walls that loom over other people's houses. Uh, we want to deal with, with um, uh, issues of, of tenting, uh, setting back at different points uh, in, in height. Uh, we've got several other things that we need to work about, but it's time for us to present some work product to you folks and for the politics to begin. Uh, because uh, as all things will be when change is suggested, uh, there will be lots of opinions, pro and con, about doing something and the details of doing it. We have presented uh, in your packages 40 or 50 pages of explanation of what we propose to do. The quick and dirty summation uh, is on uh, your sheet 40, which is to retain we're not changing. We're retaining the 35-foot residential building height, but we're changing the way it would be measured so that we don't have uh, the large walls looming where we have uh, terrain that allows uh, buildings to be as high as 45 feet that, is provide, that, that has proven to be something that some people object to. Um, we want to limit wall height uh, immediately adjacent uh, to other homes so as to allow light and privacy to, to those homes. Uh, and uh, we have some many other details that are in the, uh, in the proposal. Uh, I would, at this point, uh, don't think you want to spend the rest of the evening doing what we do many evenings, and that is go through this in great detail. Uh, but we are here uh, to provide information and feedback. Uh, you'll probably hear some other comments, and we'd like to reserve some time at the end of those comments too to reflect on, on uh, what we've heard. Alex, do you want to do something right now? Uh, sure. Hi, good evening. Hello. Alex Robinette, 2500 Hatley. Um, Brian did a good job of explaining. I'm kind of more data detail girl. Um, I think that, uh, you know, what we heard um, was that people were generally okay with the 35 feet, but we, what we also parsed out of that is that there was a, a strong emphasis on how it's measured and trying to maintain that 35 feet, trying to get rid of the loopholes that allow people to build higher. <coughs> and in that, um, we offered three options that people could look at um, in how we could change the way you measure. And there seems to be a little bit of miscommunication maybe in the public about um, what that meant. Um, so of the people that said they would like for us to change the way we measure, that was 63%. When we asked the three questions, um, option three garnered the most at 28%. The number that I'm kind of hearing circulating that are people are saying, well, only 28% of the people like this. but of those that responded to the question by selecting an option, 61% preferred parallel plane. Um, 
55% didn't even respond. So I think that's a little bit misleading of the people that actually kind of understood what we were asking and wanted to respond, <clears throat> said 61%. So um, even that is not, I think that parallel plane is really kind of intended as a visual, not necessarily as a literal. I think what we're really trying to say is that you can take, you, can, you just want a maximum height of 35 feet measured from the nearest adjacent grade. So you could basically take a pole and run it around the house. You don't have to like, like <coughs> manufacture this plane. And it's the nearest adjacent grade. So you might have a home with a steeply uh, sloping pitch. If you look, from it, look at it from down below, it might look much higher than 35 feet, but that's not where you want to measure it. You want to measure it from the adjacent grade that's next to it, probably on the side. Um, you know, what's hard for us <laughs> is that I come in here and I look at drawings on the computer, but I'm not allowed to share them. I'm not allowed to print them. I'm not allowed to take them with me to look at them. I have to, if I can, take a screenshot and then try and figure out what these things are. So I've actually spent a great deal of time looking at a lot of homes in Rollingwood, and what we're proposing is actually like a very minor change. And I think it's being perceived as something much more extensive. Um, again, I don't know if I can show you things. <laughs> that's, that's the limitation. Sure. I can't elucidate what I know to the public. Um, but can I talk about sure. a house that... <laughs> yeah, just don't use addresses, but yes. Okay, but it's hard because then people don't know what we're talking about. They can't visualize, and so, you know, it's, there's a, a home under construction. It's on the edges of rolling wood. <laughs> it's <laughs> a very steeply sloping lot um, that goes up to a flat street, makes the corner. Um, I did the measurements with my, with the 35 foot rule. Most people might look at that house and think, gosh, that's huge. Like that, that house is, you know, exceeding all sorts of height limitations, but it doesn't. It actually stair steps up the hillside with what we're proposing. And so it doesn't actually exceed 35 feet. And I, it doesn't, you know, they're following our current rules. They had carte blanche to do what they want under our rules, current Rollingwood rules, and, and they still did the right thing. And that's the point, is that most people are sort of doing the right thing. There's very few outliers. Um, if you got the photos in the in the packet, I can't show you the drawings, which would help clarify. But again, a couple of the houses only cut off the very top portion. Um, you can almost build most of the house that's there. You could just probably change the roof. So and it's excuse not. Excuse me, but yeah. point of order, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Um, why? Um, can't Ms. Um, Ramanette show pictures? She can show pictures. No. I can show photos, and that's yeah. all y'all have. You I can't, can't show you drawings. Oh. You, yeah. Oh, you mean the construction drawings? The construction drawings. Yes. Yeah. Which oh. is where all the numbers are. <laughs> I see. And it, I can't actually. The only reason I was saying about the address is we, we're not posted for a specific address. That was, oh, that was my okay. point. I was just a little confused. And then the reason on the drawings is copyright considerations. Correct. But this is not commercial use, so it would be fair use. Yeah. Right. Anyway. So. That was, okay. What was that, Charlie? I, I agree with that. It's just a uh, conservative approach to making sure we don't make somebody who has copyrighted documents. I was just saying it'd be fair use, non-commercial use, to use them for to make your points, and yeah. that it would not violate copyright law. The permit is allowed under the permit. <laughs> yeah, I think that's very fair <laughs> use. Yeah. Anyway, I think you'd be allowed to show us stuff if you want to, but yeah. well, I think we got a picture up on the screen. So. Yeah, there's a photo. Um, <laughs> okay. There's another house that is um, on Vale that has come up a number of times. The owner feels that under the current rules that we're proposing, they would not have been able to build their home, but I actually looked at this, and because of the way we're talking about measuring from nearest adjacent grade or parallel plane, um, 
the house is completely compliant. And so um, I think this is just hard to understand what we're proposing. And so I'm happy to help clarify. <coughs> So what, how would you define nearest adjacent grade? Um, well, in this case, the nearest adjacent grade to the, to the high point of that house is directly below, and that's 45 feet. Um, you could also say, um, yeah, so. <laughs> so that's okay. non-compliant under the it's, new rule. That one is non-compliant. However, Proposed under what right. right. proposed. That's what I meant. I'm sorry. I, I, I don't have the well, drawings. I need to go back. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, you're not on the record, so I'm going to let Alex continue to go. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> what, what we're showing is a few examples of the difference between the current ordinance, what is allowed in the current ordinance, which gets us to the 45 feet on the, on the uh, drawing or on the picture on the screen, versus what we're proposing. Okay. And we're trying to make the point that what we're proposing by simply stepping things down where a lot is sloped, either up or down from the street, allows 35 <coughs> feet and keeps, keeps us within the 35 feet, but does not affect many of the homes that have been built that are very large. We're not against large houses. We're not against architectural um, uh, inventiveness. What we're, the, the, the community wants us to figure a way to have 35 feet as the standard and have something that's enforceable. And a straight line from wherever you want to measure it on the structure to the ground, original ground is a way, an easy way to, to measure compliance. So what we're talking about is how comparisons of what was allowed now versus what we would propose under the documentation that we've given you. May I, may I ask a question on that? Uh, on the example that's on the screen, then under the, under the proposed rule, oh, this is be here. under the proposed rule, would the right-hand side of the building need to be stepped down by Yes. Yeah. On the left, on the left-hand side, it's, it's okay. Mm -hmm. But on the right-hand side, there would need to be a step down. That yeah. is correct. Okay. Yeah. But it seems like that's a question mark existing grade. Like it is because I don't. That's yeah. my guess. <clears throat> okay. I don't know. Is it's you know I'm I'm extrapolating. <laughs> and that house was permitted. Uh, turn your microphone. Uh, your microphone. Too. Sorry. At, at the time this house was permitted, we did not have the current language, which requires that the existing grade be identified for purposes of Correct. establishing the 45 foot or 35 foot yeah. limit. And interestingly, this house also, if you've seen some of our suggestions about building height limits along various setbacks, starting at a 10 foot setback, it would be 25 feet. This house is actually compliant. So on the left, it's on a 10 foot setback. I'm sorry, it's not in the photo. Um, it, it has a 25 foot building height. So even this would sort of pass muster with what we're proposing. There's another home under construction. Um, currently, it's a builder spec home. It's large, but we, we took it and we took the city of Austin's tenting rule and that's how we arrived at 25 feet. If you use their metric, and when you carry it over, you get to a 25 foot building height, which is generous. It's a two story <coughs> building with foundation and flooring and all of those things. So this is, like again, it's a, it's a builder spec home that would meet our, our setback limits we're suggesting on the 10 foot setback. So. One question here. Yeah. Could you show on this uh, drawing where the 25 foot uh, compliance would occur? I'm not seeing that, know you know, I'm not seeing that. It would be here. Okay. And I do have photos, I'm sorry, on my computer, but not. If it's touch
So it's not fully compliant because of the, the it exceeds the 35 feet on the right side, but if, if. It would not be under the. We're, under we the new rule. Saying, we're not saying that this house is non-compliant with the building code. It's compliant with the code as it exists today. What we're doing is drawing an, a, a comparison between what the proposed code would do. That's what I'm trying to understand. Okay, and the proposed code would require that on the end to the right, as I'm facing this, that building would be too high. That portion of the building would be too high. Okay, thank you. And, and Alex, what? What do you consider? So, if you're if you're talking about adjacent grade, is that adjacent grade based on the plans as as it would be built, or is it natural grade as it exists at the time that it construction? It's began? which is ever is lower, so either existing grade, or if they carve down, they excavate, then that becomes the new data point because what you don't want to see is forty five, you know, something much larger. You're trying to keep it in scale. You know, this isn't perfect and it isn't easy and it's it's actually really really challenging <laughs> to find something because you know, there are there are, you know, and it's not necessarily something that like we as a committee think that this is great. This is what we've heard. Like we were really limited. People wanted us to keep it at 35 feet, but they wanted us to enforce 35 feet and they don't want to change the side setbacks. And so <laughs> you're, you have to like find that sweet spot based on what you think you've heard. Um, it would be easier to make the setbacks greater or lower the building height, but that's not what we heard. Um, you know, there are houses that I think they, they did a good job of having a 45 foot wall that comes to a peak um, and it's only because from the street it's a two-story house, but they might have carved out a, dr a side entry drive. Having a side entry drive gives you more setback because you have to be able to get into the garage. So already you're pulling yourself away from your neighbor. That's a good thing. You know, nobody's really s impacted by the tall height because it appears to be a two-story house. I, I would suggest that the Board of Adjustment maybe be given some liberty to allow people with conditions like that to, you know, have a little bit more leniency with buy-in from their neighbors. And I think that in order to do that, I think that's another piece, it's really hard for most people to interpret drawings and to understand scale and what they're seeing. And I think even on this house, the builder wrote that he didn't actually understand how big it was gonna be. He actually, I think, blamed Rolling Woods rules for allowing it, <laughs> literally, in his email. <laughs> so so it, it's, it's misleading. And it's similarly, when things are built, it's misleading. A lot of people say, please go field verify this height because it seems large. And it's, it is compliant. And so I think that if you were to allow some leniency, you have to have strong visuals. You have to require people to produce uh, images of their proposed home with the neighbors as well so that somebody can really understand the scale of what's coming so that's kind of my suggestion okay. uh, All right. uh, questions and then I do have one other CRCRC member on um, online that will recognize and then I'll take public testimony but out do you have a question? Yeah, it was just a question you mentioned Austin in the for the for the um, tenting the mm -hmm. step did you guys, what does Westlake Hills do? Like, that seems. Well, they have a lower height limit and they have a side articulation rule, but I don't know that they have, they might have, um, a lot of people call it bulk plane instead of tenting, mm -hmm. um, which there are quite a lot of examples, um, but actually I'm not totally certain for <coughs> Westlake. We could not yeah, hear that. that? He's yeah, they do step, they do the sort of tenting stepping. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions for Alex? Just one other question. I mean, I've seen, you know, at least one house that is more than one house that 
is on a very steep lot backs up to essentially commercial there's nothing back there mm -hmm. it's a perfect opportunity to cantilever a house mm -hmm. that's just going to have to be a board of adjustment issue i would think so i mean i think that that person would really have to ask themselves like what are the limitations of that site truly you know mm -hmm. and right. structurally that makes sense and i mm -hmm. think that that's another kind of overarching thing for me is that when you buy a lot you know you, you need to find the strengths of that lot and recognize the weaknesses of that lot. A lot of people just try and transform a, a landscape into something completely foreign to what it started out with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't, I don't think we want to encourage that. I think you want to work with what's available. I mean, that's just what makes things more harmonious. So but to answer your question, yeah, probably Board of Adjustment. All right. Well, I just also want to take the chance to thank you and the rest of the committee for all your hard work. And I know you guys are very highly qualified experts who are much sought after Maybe. in your field. <laughs> and so <laughs> to do all this work for volunteer basis, yeah. we really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Um, any, anything else? Uh, with that, Chair recognizes Tom Farrell, also on the CRCRC. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, Alex for doing such a great job of researching and doing this. It was unbelievable the amount of work that she put forward to bring uh, at least me to uh, look at this because uh, she did a, just a marvelous job. It was like uh, uh, a lot of this was was foreign to me and she, she was able to make it kind of make sense to me. I realize that we're ongoing with this, and this is just one of the steps in the process, and, and uh, we'll do that. My, my real point that I originally raised my hand on, Mr. Mayor, was that the, I know we've had problems about determining uh, where the 35 feet starts from, and I think the, the way that this is structured with natural grade or building grade, whichever is lower, is the proper way to go about doing that. So anyway, I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Um, okay, is there anyone else on CRCRC that wishes to speak? Okay, with that, we will um, have any pu public testimony of anyone wishing to testify. I think we have Mr. Clinton. Thank you, Council. Uh, Ryan Clinton, 4714 Timberline Drive. Um, I uh, want to thank everyone also. Um, I, it was a whole lot of work. I know it's uh, an immense amount of work to serve on the commission. Uh, it's an immense amount of work to get that much public participation. It's an immense amount of work to do what you guys do as well. So I appreciate both uh, the committee and you guys for, for taking the time to take these things seriously and investigate as much as possible. Uh, as you know, as well as some of you know, I was on the CRCRC for some, for, for at least a, a portion of the time, and, and that I resigned. And uh, I think I only had one council member ask me why, but I figured I would give you give uh, the rest uh, the opportunity to hear it uh, today. Uh, and 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 okay, too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was uh, concerned about the validity of the survey, um, and specifically that uh, one of the questions that said. Uh, would, should we consider would, we, would be deemed support for the thing instead of should we consider? Um, I answered yes to should we consider just about everything because I think we should consider everything. That doesn't mean that I supported any of the specific pro policy proposals. Um, and I think that, that that was inherently invalid from the start. Um, the other reason is because I was concerned that an initial policy proposal that was floated was, was, was locked in. Um, and that there wasn't a lot of, uh, in my view, true openness to considering um, alternatives or, or where the community was, and that it was locked in before the survey went out. And, and um, the solution um, uh, emanating uh, and, and that we've now come up with is the solution that was floated before the survey went out. Um, and the would you consider questions are being used, answers are being used as positive <coughs> answers, as support, and 28% uh, uh, in support of the solution that is being proposed is, is very, very low. 
we can play games with statistics all day. We can say that America wants a certain president because 90% of the party that voted for that person wants that person. Um, but 28% is 28%. It's a very low percent. It does not suggest a community consensus. Um, I'll also note that I think some of the summaries were put together by ChatPT. For those lawyers in the room, they already know this. You can be sanctioned for using ChatPT. The reason that you can be sanctioned for using ChatPT is that ChatPT is a word predictor. Uh, it predicts what the next word in a sentence will be based on the data that you, are, that you give it. That's how it works. That's how it operates. Um, and as a re result of that, it hallucinates. And so, for example, I asked ChatPT, what are the 10 largest, uh, mo what are the 10 most important oil and gas cases in Texas precedent? Uh, it gave me 10. Uh, three of them were actual cases. Um, all of the summaries of those cases were wrong. Uh, the seven, other seven, it completely made up. Um, they do not exist. The cases, the names, nor the holdings in those cases. Um, in my conversations with residents, which I did a whole lot, um, actually rode around with people, talked to people, grabbed people off the street, rode around in golf carts, what I heard was uh, I did not hear any support for eliminating the adjustment for sloped homes. Um, as a, from, a, from, a, from a mathematical perspective, if you have a flat home and you go up 35 feet, you have a, a, a rectangular volume um, three, in 3D. Uh, on a sloped home, if you take that, those same rules, you mathematically have a lot less volume. And the reason you have a lot less volume is because you have to count for the slope because a floor can't be sloped. The floor has to be flat, therefore the delta between the slope and the floor is what you lose. The adjustment that's in the current ordinance, which by the way I do not like, so I'm not against change, I fully support changing the, uh, the current ordinance, I don't think it is, a, is great, but the delta, the, the adjustment in the current ordinance is intended to make up for some of that delta that is lost from a math, purely mathematical perspective on a slope lot. Um, I think there's an argument. For, for it being too much of an adjustment, um, as is indicated in, in the photo that was, was, was put up. But that is not an argument for eliminating some adjustment for the fact that mathematically you have less volume if you apply the same rules to, to a slope block. Um, what I did on my brief time, one of the things I did on my brief time on the um, CRCRC was um, circulate a proposal that I thought was a compromise. I emailed all of you at, uh, today. Um, I have copies if anybody didn't see the email. Um, but basically, uh, the short version is um, to maintain um, flexibility for slope lots, but to prevent anything from being close uh, to the sides and in an opposing manner for anything, any uh, lot around it. Um, and because that's what I heard from the community. Uh, in talking to community residents is what we really hate is these giant 45-foot walls. They're imposing, they look over into our backyards, um, they change the character of the neighborhood, they're simply too tall. Um, and the proposal, that, the compromise proposal that I circulated would affect that house because it would push that back, uh, that top layer back. And that was one of the things that was apparent at one of some of the early CRCRC meetings is that if you push elevation away from the sides, it, it dramatically changes the way that it imposes on neighbors. So that was my uh, attempt at a compromise to both um, a f to, to <coughs> fix the problem, the big problem that most people were, were coming to me with, which was these 40-foot imposing walls, but also to not um, discriminate against um, sloped home lots that, again, mathematically had less um, volume to play with. So I'm against the CRC proposal. Um, I think that it bears out the concerns that I had, that it is in fact largely the proposal that was made prior to the survey going out. Um, that the express answer to the survey did not indicate that the public was, uh, was in favor of this solution. Um, that people are picking and choosing uh, phrases from the survey and comments to come up with a different answer than the one that the community expressly gave. And I can use an example of my own. I'm not going to flag it, but one of my own responses was used in the backup material as evidence that the community really does want something that the survey didn't say that it did. Um, and I can assure you that my uh, comment was not intended <coughs> to, be, to be used as support uh, for this. It also, as I said, negatively impacts 
um, and unfairly and unnecessarily sloped homes because it fixes a problem that is greater than the one that the community has. It actually makes it um, much less, much more difficult to achieve volume on a sloped home. The goal of this effort, and I spoke to Council, Mem Council Member McDuffie about this, in my opinion, should be to uh, fix the problem, th the, the consensus problem, without fixing more than that, without doing more than fixing the consensus problem. I think this very much does more than fixing the consensus problem because I think it discriminates based on slope lot, lot homes. Um, the last thing that I want to say is that um, uh, I apologize to the uh, PNZ for not being there yesterday. I didn't know. That's on me. That's not on them or anybody else. Um, I do think that the way we did this with the commercial planning zone uh, commission was better in that we had one plan, it went to council, lots of notice went out, lots of people knew about it, they attended, and, and we were able to talk about it in public. Whereas the, in a piecemeal effort to do this, it makes it a lot more difficult for the public to know. Um, a lot of people called me frantically today not knowing that this was happening. A lot of text messages frantic today saying, I can't believe this is happening. Um, I, would, I would suggest at the very least that any vote on this be postponed for a month so that people can know that it's happening, but I think it makes more, much more sense <coughs> to not do it piecemeal, do it one time so the community can come together. Thank you. I, I have a question for you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, so uh, thank you for sending your proposal that you had before. Um, and I'm looking at it, trying to compare it to the CRCRC proposal. and. What I can see is the difference is you're defining that reference plane as the average, you said, between foremost and rearmost walls. Yeah, what I was trying to do is have a horizontal plane. Right. So what the, what the CRCRC does not do is have a horizontal plane. And the, the way you should imagine the CRCRC proposal and my understanding of it is that imagine the topography of your lot. Yeah, well, the, the plane. The, your plane is ex that exact topography, 35 feet right. higher. Um, so if, like my lot, uh, it falls down on the left uh, 40 feet from top <coughs> to bottom, um, and then it falls off to the right a little bit, and then it falls off halfway through um, on the right-hand side, um, that, would be, that would define my height, which would be 40 feet down in some places. I couldn't even, I don't know that I could connect my house. Well, I was point, trying to figure out how you make the average because I wasn't sure about foremost and rearmost because are you going to take the four, you know, you're going to take the plane um, like lengthwise or the depth of the house or both? Yeah, and, and again, this was an early on throwing it out for consideration. Okay. So I, I didn't mean that. for you to try to uh, then, then pass me, this tonight, but it was, I was trying to get an average of me, either the front or the back. Let me get to my next kind sure. of request then. If you could look at the CRCRC recommendation and sort of red line strike out that thing to say, say to change it to re reflect the plane, you know, include your plane definition. Because it's also the CRCRC also has the recommendation of the 25 foot by the setback that I don't see in yours. So it's a slightly different version of it. Um, mine goes to 35 because again, I was trying to solve the problem of but the complaint that most people had was they thought it was unfair that slope lots were getting 45 feet in some locations. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to trim that down to 35 feet. You could never get more than 35 feet adjacent to your neighbor's <coughs> homes or on the front or on the back. But if you look at these examples, like I think this 35 feet adjacent to the neighbors that we've seen is too high and that the 25 foot that then works its way up to 35 feet really helps address the problem of looming is what I call it, but that's to me, I agree with you that the problem is not necessarily, or, or I think um, um, Alex said it, is the problem is not necessarily the height, but it's the looming over the neighbors. And so this really, this 25 foot really helps solve that. I know some other people have had the looming neighbor problem mm -hmm. and, and, it's, and it's, it's, it's not great when it goes up 35 feet right next to you, like that 10 feet away right. from your line. And, and in some ways, mine was more restrictive than theirs because mine did it on the front as well. So that's why it would push back that top level uh, on the picture mm -hmm. that was shown. Um, and in some ways, mine was less restrictive because it was 35 feet on the sides instead of 25 feet. And I was also trying to gather, because I think that, I'm not sure which house that is, but one of the houses has a huge second story in the back that would not be affected by the CRCRC's proposal, but would be affected by mine. 
because under mine you have to come down in the back uh, at the back at the at the back of your house. So you couldn't have 45 feet. Uh, I guess you could have 35 seat feet. So maybe it's roughly the same. But this is a side. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. That house doesn't uh, go to the rear setback, so it can go up to 35 feet. That particular house. Correct. I, I can't see the picture. Okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. It's not, it doesn't build all, it didn't fill the entire building. Yeah, and space. I may have the wrong home in mind, but there's a home in mind where I know a lot of people are complaining about the second story in the back being too close to the, and so, again, these, no, and, I, and I think you'll see in here, I said the numbers are for conversation's sake. I didn't intend to no, stick to any number. But the main issue is the definition of the plane. I think that's the problem because you eliminate, uh, by making it 35 feet above grade at any point, you'll, you uh, make it, extremely difficult to build on slope lots. Ms. Brown. Um, Brian, have you gone back to the CRCRC to debate your proposal versus theirs or to discuss it? I don't think I'm allowed to make a proposal at the CRCRC if I'm not on it, but no, I have not gone back well, and remade my proposal. You're to allowed it. just like any <laughs> other resident to show up and give comments. No, that, absolutely and, true. And that's where our expertise lies. And so I would really ask that you take this back to CRCRC and see if you can reach some kind of solution with the CRCRC because that's, and then bring that back to us. Fair, absolutely fair enough. But yes, you're absolutely right. I have not gone back since I, uh, and that's where our, I that's myself. where our expertise is. Sure. So I would sincerely ask that you do that. Okay. Any questions for Ryan? Thank you. Well, I've got one oh, wait. for Ryan. Uh, so one of the things that's helpful, at least to me, when we're having these discussions, um, is to have some degree of visuals that, that show the interpretation of the code and stuff like that. I mean, I had difficulty interpreting, you know, your, what you wrote. I, I just couldn't visualize it. Yeah, so and I apologize. I don't have access to any of that well, software, I mean, and I'm not a <laughs> if you, math If you person, could get so. anybody to help you to do that, <laughs> it, would, it would certainly help people such as myself to actually understand the differences between what's being proposed by the CRCRC and what, what you're discussing because, yeah, I, I, I couldn't really ferret it out. I think the tenting is roughly the same I concept, except for that I had proposed it applying on the front to eliminate 45 or extremely high facades. So and the 40 the foot drop off that you have at the back just gets ignored or removed or I mean, I, I, I'm not trying to pin you down, but I'm just not understanding when you're talking about the averages, like and you said you've got 45. Oh, from my home? Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah, it's 40 feet from top to back according to a okay. GPS survey that somebody gave me. Okay. Um, so that wouldn't be within the buildable area. The buildable area would be smaller than that within the setbacks. Or you'd have to step it down. Yeah, I mean, I just, I don't know what the purpose of that is. It, the height stays the same, right? A maximum height stays the same. So right. I don't understand why I would artificially have to do that because then I lose a volume that other people get in their houses. I can't, I'm sorry, I so, can't. Yeah, I was just saying, I don't understand what, how this benefits society for me to have to have a, uh, a Lego home. Well, I think um, in well, your case it doesn't because right. you back up to a rather large green right. belt and that's why I think Board of Adjustment. If you, if you take that be. same concept with the, with the house whose address shall not be given, but right. it's on a corner and it's next to, it backs up to a house that's much lower how is that fixed in your proposal? By the, by, the, by, the, by the tenting, so that nothing can be close to your neighbors that's high. The, my, my uh, tell me in specifics, how would you measure the height limit for that, the back of that house under your proposal? I'm not, I apologize, I'm not following the answer to your, I'm not following your question, but okay, my goal no. is to. Let's say this, sure. you're on a slope lot uh, if you, if you uh, use the current rule, the 35-foot limit 
plus 10 feet and wherever the highest point is, uh, uh, that becomes the top most point for <coughs> whatever wall begins at the lowest point on the lot. That's, that's the problem. How does your solution fix that problem on a sloped lot? Because of the tenting. So uh, in the back. Explain in words what tenting is, please. It would eliminate that further, sorry. It would eliminate that furthest corner that is closest to. And how, by, by what means does it limit that? What are the words that are used to limit it? It does exactly what, it, it does something very similar to what this does, which is it stair steps your ability to, to build within a certain distance of your back setback. Well, that's what's in, I don't understand how that's different than what's in the CRCRC proposal. And I'm agreeing with you that the concept of the tenting in the CRCRC proposal is very similar to the concept of the tenting, of tenting in mind with some adjustments. Theirs is more restrictive in some ways and less and restrictive so in some ways. So detail that for me. What are the differences? So in, in the proposal that I had circulated, I also apply the tenting to the front of the house. It's my understanding that the CRCRC does not apply the tenting to the front of the house. And the reason I did that is because we had looked at some houses and everybody agreed, yes, that story on the top is high, but with the right architectural features, if it's set back from the front of the house, it doesn't okay. visually affect. And so and I attempted to do that both on the front and the back. So the, the, what would be the limit on the back wall? What would be the height limit under your proposal on the back wall from original grade? It would, and it, though, again, the numbers, I was trying to create a concept, so the numbers are less important than the concept, but I, would at, at, I did at 35 feet, but from the back so setback, from, from, or sorry, from the buildable area. So you essentially never could build above 35 feet on a line that your neighbor is going to see. Okay, I need to see diagrams because I... I'm, I'm just... Yeah, and I, I apologize. I wish I had the skill set and thing. software to create that, but I, I don't. I don't. Either, but I mean, Yes, yeah, so the, uh, here, here's what I think, I think, and the public, I think, there's some uh, uh, lack of clarity. In, in the current uh, ordinance that, that I agree should be changed, you don't ever go above 35 feet. You, you don't ever go the, above the 35 feet from the defined location. You're never above that point. It's just that your lot can slope down at places beneath your defined set point. And so because of that, it can create a 45 foot wall, a maximum under the current existing code, which again, I'm not in support of. But your maximum height, your absolute height, which I like to call it, never changes. A sloped lot does not get a higher maximum height. Well, I would say it this way. Your, the maximum elevation of the roof doesn't change. The, the maximum height of the wall changes. Yeah, the distance, yes, the distance between ground and height and, and, the, and the top can change yes. because your, your slope can fall down. And so then it becomes the question I think Councilmember Lachine have said, Lachine was talking about is where do, you, where do you set the point? And I was attempting to set the point at a place that would be as least offensive as possible, given all of, allowing people with sloped owners to still build within volume and yet also addressing the concern of 45-foot okay, walls. Okay, where is the set point under your proposal? And, and again, this if was a long time ago, and I'm not trying okay. to, I, my, the whole point of bringing it here to sending it to you today is that there are other options out there that I think do a better, can do a better job, and this may not be it, but could do a better job of solving the problem that everybody seems to be most concerned about without negatively affecting slope owner, well, slope owners as much. For, for instance, on this one, which we've said, doesn't go to the back setback, this property. Yes. Okay, so even if we're doing a tenting line, this might still, ha I don't know, I don't know how far back from the back setback it is. That's not the back. That's this the is the back. That's this the back. is the back, right over oh, here. Oh, okay. Right over here is the back. I get it, okay. Okay, right. so if we're, Doing a tent from there, that might still pass muster, but we still got a 45 foot. Yeah. Boom. 
Yeah, and I don't like the 45. I'm, I'm I, against I know, the 45 foot, too. I I'm just too. saying, yeah. like, I mean, when things, things get concrete, when you, once again, I, I think we're all kind of in the, in the land of, you actually have to have a visual, you have to have a building, you have to be able to see what we're discussing and how it can be interpreted. And for instance, on this one, if they had gone back to the back setback, it would have been even more egregious, perhaps, to some people. Um, but, you know, the house next to it does a cut in and a, and a setback. And I think that's the reason that the people right next to <clears throat> it's not as right. bothersome to people. But, I mean, I, I, I don't know that this wouldn't pass muster with the tenting because we haven't done the geometry to see. I agree with that. Or perhaps maybe they would have to cut off a little bit of their peak. They might have had to push yeah. back the second yeah. level, which visually makes it a lot less offensive. Right. Um, anyway. So uh, two points. Um, one is I really like the tenting. Okay, I think it solves a lot of the problems. I'd like to see the tending applied to the back of the houses too. I don't think it needs to be applied to the front, but when it's houses looming over the neighbor's backyard, and in that case, I've talked to the neighbor who's still very upset over that house looming over her backyard. And, um, and, and I think that helps a lot with the problems we have. Otherwise, when we're talking about whether to measure from the topographical grade that sits below each point on the house, which is the new proposal versus this old ordinance that added some feet to the height based on the, if there was a difference in grade from one end of the house to the other versus a proposal that you might have in your mind that we haven't seen yet, okay, which I'm happy to look at if you write one up or find one that you'd like to copy from another city. Um, but it seems to me that there is such a diversity or such a, a, a big deviation from lot to lot to lot in topography that it's hard to write a rule that doesn't create problems other than to say use the existing topographical grade and then go to Board of Adjustment for differences and I know everyone hates to throw things to the Board of Adjustment I know you don't like that because it's like your house is the perfect example for Board of Adjustment because you've got the most extreme slope that I've seen on a lot with 40 feet. I mean, you could end up with a 70, you know, foot, five foot house if you take 35 plus the 40 foot grade difference. Just I know that's not what anyone's proposing, but I'm just saying it could be that high in under some iterations of some imaginary height ordinance. Um, but also some lots only vary five feet, you know, from front to back. My lot varies a lot but we just stepped down with the lot because that's what the architect designed and you know good for him i'm glad he did it i liked it the way it turned out but um i just i just think that with your lot being so extreme and with there being no problem with it being tall relative to the people behind you you back up to a green belt it's like if there was a neighbor there with a backyard that'd be one thing but there's not so <coughs> i don't know how we say this give leeway to board of adjustment but i would encourage <laughs> i would just say i don't know how to draft an ordinance that covers every slope lot in town that's what i'm guess i'm trying to say well I, I, it seems to me that that uh, what we need is to have ryan go back go with your proposal back to crc and work with them on coming up whether or not there should be an exception for a slope lot of grade greater than X that doesn't back up to another residential property. So that, you know, that can be, that's a drafting issue. And, a, you know, a, some, it just takes some driving around the neighborhood to see if that's going to cause a problem somewhere else. But let's get this done. Let's, you know, let's get this done. We can work these problems out if we'll sit down and talk with one another and get it resolved. Okay. Any other questions? Council? Um, yes. I, I do have someone I, else that's wishing to testify. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Rodgers. Uh, two points, if I may. <clears throat> one, I'm the sucker that was appointed when Ryan 
You stepped away. <laughs> 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 <All right. laughs> I'll forgive you. Um, in the time that I've been there, uh, I we have not had, which has been months now, and many meetings because we're meeting twice a month. We have not had a single person from the community show up and want to talk with us. Our meetings are as informal as sitting around a table, although we use these devices because we're a public body and we have to be recorded, but we are wrestling with these issues just like Ryan is, and we would love to see what the input is. We spent the first couple of months of my time going through 2,200 comments trying to understand what people want. And one of the things that we gathered from that is, and, and tonight's discussion is an example of it, people want something that is definable, that can be drawn and, and understood and enforced. And that with the horizontal planes that have changed over the last few months and things is, is something that we're trying to wrestle with. And we come up with something like Kevin or Phil have suggested, and that is we're going to do the very best we can to achieve something that is definable, understandable, and drawable. And then if we do have lots, particularly we have talked about lots that do not back up to another house, creating some kind of a, of a allowance for that if necessary. But um, we have taken very seriously trying to find something that works and can be implemented. That's been one of the big issues that we found in reading all those comments. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Come, okay. come meet with us, Ryan. We're just a, we're just a debating society. Okay. <laughs> all right. I also have uh, Ryan Coleman wishing to testify. Ryan, come on up. Identify the, the yourself. Ryan's are up today. Yes. <laughs> big day for the Ryan. So my name is Ryan Coleman. I live at three two one two Park Hills and. I actually just found out about this tonight and don't know anything about the CRCRC committee, which is great because I'd love to go talk to them. Um, I'm a luxury home builder. I've done many, many homes in Westlake Hills, Travis County, 78746, Hill Country, Lake Austin, and I'm very familiar with how the city of Westlake Hills took their approach and kind of how they approach in Travis County, city of Austin, further out. And I think a good case study for you all, and I don't have answers, because I just found out about this and I'd love to think about it more. Um, I think a perfect case study is if you go in the city of Westlake Hills, they, I, I believe their max building height is 32 feet. And you go into the hills, every house looks the same. Every house has a flat roof, it's homogenized. You have maybe different materials, more glass, more wood, more plaster, but all the homes look the same and it's because they took the stepped approach because you have to go with the natural grade, and if you're on a 20% incline, your house has to step down. So what that does is that eliminates the option of having interesting roof lines. Um, I love rolling wood because there's such a unique diversity of different roof types, flat, uh, shed, gabled, and on a lot that has you know, 15, 20% grade, if you're taking that stepping approach, you'll never have a gabled roof because that point of your gabled roof, that eats into that 35 feet. And no one wants eight foot ceilings anymore on new homes. So if you drive in the city of Westlake Hills, you go in the hills, every house is flat roof. Every house look, has a similar feel. And if you come in closer, like Eanes, those little uh, streets across from Eanes Elementary, a lot of those are more interesting roof lines. You have gabled and more traditional. I would say Rolling Woods, a more traditional neighborhood in the Westlake Hills. So that's one thing that I would take into account is people want these flat roofs, modern homes now, but things change. And you might be writing a code that in five years, people want gabled roofs and y'all you have this new kind of simplified 35 feet the rule, but now everyone wants to change how their homes look and y'all change the code and you have to rethink it. I don't think there's uh, because of the slope lots in Rollingwood, I don't think there's one size fits all because every lot is different. So I don't have a solution. And in the city of Westlake Hills, I've never really thought about it enough to know what the solution is. But I think I love the idea of tenting that they do in the city of Austin because bottom line is like the picture you shoot, shown, have shown on Park Hills, people don't want, want offensive homes. 
They don't want things that are blood, like, you know, we love living in Texas because we have land and you don't like, in New York City, I feel like I'm claustrophobic because there's these big buildings and you don't want that next to you. So I think bottom line is people don't want homes next to them that are blocking their views, that are offensive, that change their quality of life. Um, so I just, I, I think it's not as simple as like 35 feet and because every lot's different. Um, a lot of lots in Rollingwood are flat. Some are slightly inclined. Some on Timberline and Wood Circle are very sloped and I don't think there's a one, one size fits all um, that you can say 35 feet is, will, will work for everyone. And I'd love to c come speak with the CRCRC. <clears throat> question for mm -hmm. you and you may not want to answer this and I understand if you don't sure. do. but are you uh, do you build for homeowners or do you build spec houses both both, both. you uh -huh. do both okay mm -hmm. so um and my wife she has her master's in architecture from, from UT and she designs our homes for our clients and spec projects as well okay so I'm almost an architect <laughs> Boss, osmosis. I bet, That's I about bet it. There'd be debate in your home about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She probably won't agree, but I went through her grad school with her. So, <laughs> Alan. Yes, yeah. Sir? The question I have is around the tenting, and in your experience, uh, does that affect? How does that affect the square footage of the house? Um, it does affect build. the square footage, but really, what it's doing is it gets rid of that offense from the neighboring lots. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's some lots in Rollingwood that are larger that if you built something that was 45 feet tall, you might not have a neighbor for, you know, 50 feet and it wouldn't offend them. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, some people have quarter acre lots, some people have 0.4 acre lots, some people have 0.6 acre lots, some people have pie shaped lots. It's all different in the city. So that's why I don't think there's necessarily um, a one size fits all. I want to think it through and I'd love to talk to the committee about what they've they've talked about because I think it's something to think about because you maybe unintentionally are are going to change what the neighborhood looks like by just setting a, a roof height because everything on a, a sloped lot will be a flat roof I, I, well I was just going to say I, I built a modern house on a sloped lot and it, you can see it on Lake Flato's website Rollingwood uh, residence is what they call it uh -huh. and it it does not have a flat roof okay, okay so when you when say did you build no, it huh when did you build it nine years ago okay and and you know and it's it it's got a sloped roof but it doesn't exceed the height limits and, and I wanted okay. a right. hold on hold, hold up I, you, no no you're good you're good i just need you on the mic <laughs> so. sure. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, um, thank you for all your comments i think sure. it's really helpful i do want to draw your attention to some houses that have been built they're actually right across the street from me on Hatley, mm -hmm. close to Vale, between Riley and Vale. And they have pretty steeply pitched roofs. On Riley? They're, no, they're on Hatley, on, Hatley. on the north side of the street. But um, they do not exceed the 35-foot limit, and they stair-step down, and they're huge houses mm -hmm. with steeply pitched roofs. So I do actually think that there's probably more examples in the neighborhood that would fit within the parameters we suggested that are traditional. Okay. So, okay. Ryan, any other comments? No. So I, I okay. have a quick question. question for him. So you said that nobody wants eight foot ceilings mm. anymore and 35 feet is not adequate to accommodate that, but you can build a two story house with a pitched roof and yeah, I, the 35 I, feet is not a problem, right? I totally agree, but some people want to, you know, for the prices they're, they're paying for a lot now in rolling wood, um, you know, and if you have a, a lot that's 20% grade, um, you can reach that 35 feet pretty quick. But you can from fit, natural grade. You can fit a two-story house in a 35 feet. Oh, absolutely. A, you can fit it in 24 feet. Right. So the issue is not that you can't. No, no, no. A two-story house on a flat lot. With, 35 feet is. I mean, 30 feet's enough. Easy. Right. But, I mean, even less. But I'm saying on a you're, you're basically punishing someone with a sloped lot because if you're measuring from natural grade, if you have a 20% grade and you're dropping, you know, 20 feet amongst your house, you're losing that 20 feet and you're having to sh step it down or shrink the, the height. Because if you're measuring from, if it's 35 feet from natural grade and you're going down a hill, 
you might be 35 feet at the, at the front, you might not, your house might not be that tall, but as you step down, you're gonna have to stair step down to be 35 feet from natural grade. You which know, there's a, there's a whole lot of houses that were built originally in Rollingwood on sloped lots and they're split level. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, I've lived in one for 30 years. You know, <laughs> works just fine. So I, I have an issue with that being a, a, a problem that stair stepping down a slope is an issue. It depends on the lot. If it's, you know, 5% grade, a gradual uh, slope, but some lots in, in the city have pretty substantial sloping on it. So okay. my, to my point, I don't think there's a one size fits all because every lot's different. Well, we're going to have to make a ordinance that applies to all of the homes. And, right. And, and that's right, but I'm saying there could be, if yeah. there is more than a 20% grade, this rule is and, in place. And that's why we have a, a board of adjustment, too. Sure. So. Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. Which you thank, thank you, Ryan. Appreciate you being here. Uh, please do uh, visit with CRCRC. Uh, any, anyone else wishing to testify on this particular issue? And do we have anyone online? Nope. Mr. Harvey? Recognize Mr. Harvey. Uh, thank you, Gavin. Um, I think the only things I just wanted to add real quick is, is observing this it is one. There's no doubt the you know the CRCC has has done fantastic work, but there's also no doubt from just watching this conversation that we do not have common ground of understanding of the implications of these things. Like just just listening to everyone's questions and everyone's responses and perspectives it's it doesn't matter how much good work was done there there's not consistent understanding um of what these implications are i also wonder for the group's consideration um like are we are we are we, tr are we trying to apply objective criteria to something that is subjective and is why you have a board of adjustment in the first place um that seems interesting to me um Two other comments. Um, uh, I'm not sure I understand that last comment of I have a house that works just fine. I, I don't think your lot was worth $2 million when uh, that situation came about. And I think the implications of building in today is completely different. So I think that was a an out of context remark I'd like to remark to. I also don't understand, um, although I don't necessarily disagree with Mr. Clinton, I don't, I don't, he seems to represent a, a, a council or a board or something much bigger than just his presence individually so i i just all of those things to me point to there's lack of understanding consistent understanding amongst the community of the relevance of the things that we're considering how it works what the implications are and i think given all of those things just you know as a as a as a rolling wood citizen observing this um I think we have no choice but to punt this because I don't think anybody has a consistent enough understanding to vote on anything. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. Um, any questions for Mr. Harvey? Can, can we make sure people online announce where they live as well? Sure. Oh, I sorry, sorry about sorry. that. Uh, Forty nine oh three Southcrest, Colin Harvey. Thank you, Colin. Um, okay, anyone else wishing to testify? All right, hearing. Yes, ma'am. Shanti Jay Kumar, 3309 Park Hills Drive. Nothing outside of the ordinary. All I ask is, we are considering heights of buildings. It's almost that you are considering one building almost like an island in and of itself. Here we are, drive down and check out and see if everybody built the way you are looking at. Thankfully, they're not so far done that then you're losing privacy, you're losing access to your backyard to have some privacy so nobody is looking down on you. That's one of the biggest problems that we have had when buildings started going up. That's just not, whether you paid two million or you paid $100,000 for your home, doesn't matter, it's your home, it's your equity in that home. We built our equity for 40 years and somebody comes and builds a huge house next door to me, I have to look to see somebody's not watching down before I go for a shower. I mean, that, I mean I'm mean, i bringing it down to the nitty gritty here. It's a fact. 
I love my neighbors. I have no problem. I don't want to put a curtain on my bathroom window. <laughs> there are sometimes people up there fixing things. I shouldn't have to live that way. Or, I don't mean me personally, but there are a lot of homes. And then we have people building huge um, concrete structures as their, um, what do you call Foundation. it? Foundation. Foundation, and then building up. And then you measure from the top of that. That's happened. We know that has happened. We've often wanted to have one of those deals where you can stand on the street and measure the building. Again, I have gone through, taken pictures of every single home in Rollingwood, Flo Macklin and I did that in 2003, just to record how our city looked like back in the day. And one by one, as the buildings came down, I'm not against having bigger homes. What I am for, let's all be for something rather than against something. Let's build so that we pr preserve the neighbors' privacy and their rights to enjoyment of their property without having to um, take away that. I think everybody will be happy, you know? And luckily for us, we have a variety of homes in this neighborhood, and that's the beauty and the charm of Rollingwood, that not everybody wants a great building. I appreciate it. I forget your name, Ryan. Ryan. Uh, you're on my street. You're yeah, on Park Hills. Okay. <laughs> No, I'm not saying yeah, you yeah. have. <laughs> I I'm mean, saying it's something to consider. Yeah, so it's, it's something to keep in mind. Just don't think about height in and of itself. Think about how it impacts the four houses or five houses around from you so that they have the enjoyment of their whatever ma million dollar home that they have. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Shanti. Appreciate it. <laughs> Try to wrap up, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> The issue of how we are bringing this to you is a policy decision that we understand we've been given instructions to bring this in pieces as we get them done and not wait until we have a full package. For example, we're still working on an issue that Shanti's talked about, about the um, foundation height and what do we do about big <coughs> walls of concrete that, that just have sand and rock behind them. Do we? deal with that with landscaping? Do we not allow it? What are we going to do? We're talking about any number of things that we're still working on. And so we have not brought you a complete package. If you want to change our instructions, do so, but let us know what you want. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, exit segue out. To my comment on this, this yes. is what bothers me the most, I think, about this process so far is the piecemeal nature of it. It's really not when I voted for this to form the commission. This isn't what I had in mind. My my interpretation is this is going to pick up off from where we left off with the uh, the the resident uh, the commercial area. We were going to get a report with all these ideas. We were going to allow people to like look at all these ideas to give feedback on it. Because I, I agree with what Mr. Clinton said earlier about some of these questions. Should we look? Here's question for us. Should we look at alternate ways to measure building height? Sure, like who's going to be against wanting to possibly look at alternate ways to, that doesn't mean you necessarily support any of the ideas that were proposed because when I look and do the math here, only 44% even picked, picked one of the options. That means that there was over 60% or, is that, did I do the right? No, 56% that didn't like choose any one of those. So I don't know. I just feel like I would feel a lot better about this and more comfortable about it if we could get like everything, all these ideas, because we said, oh, we're not done yet. That's what I heard today. Like, we're gonna bring in some more things. I mean, it, it, I don't, also don't think it's fair to the residents to every month have to be worried about, okay, what's the next thing coming in? I'm gonna have to like work on, like worry about <laughs> they're gonna change. I think that we need to like bring everything in one package and uh, yeah, give, give, the, give the, the, the residents an opportunity to like comment on it. Just seems like it's, yeah, anyway. Okay. That's, that's what I have to say. No, that's 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 uh, good comments, and I appreciate that. And it actually it, it is a good segue. Uh, I think we did last month, um, or maybe two months ago, ask council kind of how how you wanted these to come to you. I think um, Chair Bench has um, to date decided to sort of try to send you things as they feel like they're ready. I 
have no opinion as to whether that's the right approach or not, uh, we're happy to bring them to you <coughs> however you want. If you want them all bundled up, we can do that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the action item, oh, there's a small, there's a faint green and a bright green. Uh, the action item tonight is to uh, get a draft prepared by city council, city attorney, by the city attorney uh, that would uh, put in code language a set of recommendations. And so it's that recommend, you know, once that, code language is drafted, then there would be a public hearing before p and and a public hearing before the city council before any decision making occurs. So uh, I, what I would recommend is that we give CRCRC maybe one more <coughs> month and ask that those, anyone that has uh, alternate proposals or additional proposals or recommendations to take those to CRCRC and then uh, um, CRCRC can vote to modify that recommendation or not so that it, we can begin the drafting process. Uh, we've had uh, just from the comprehensive plan drafting process for the commercial code which is I think simpler and less controversial it takes a while for that drafting process to happen. And so that's also a period of time where people can comment and have something more concrete to comment on. Um, so I think it's important that, that we've had this meeting and it's sharpened the focus enormously, I think. And you know, let's give it a little bit more time and let's get a recommendation so that we can get the drafting process started. Um, would be uh, what I would like for the council to think about. Okay, council. And I don't know that we're. I, I, you know, I'm. I'm. I'm just saying that because there was some discussion about that. I know we haven't stopped taking public comment yet. So I think I may be out of order. Yeah, no, I, you're good. Uh, and I think we have stopped taking. I hope. Hopefully, we've stopped, <laughs> stopped taking. But I. You, you're back. I keep coming okay. back. Okay. <laughs> just like just like trying to throw away a boomerang. Keep, yeah. Keep. The next two meetings of the CRCRC are May 14th and May 28th. We're not having a meeting late this month because of vacations and things. We're into that period of the summer where it's hard to get people together for a quorum. I, for example, will be in Europe on May the 14th. But uh, bring the discussions on, and we'll we'll move as That's fast. That's good. As will we you can. repeat those dates one more time? May May 14th and May 28th. Okay. Yeah. All right, five o'clock. Where? Yes, we meet at five o'clock. We meet five to seven, and we revolt mm -hmm. uh, at seven o'clock and walk away, whether the chairman has uh, ended the meeting or not. <laughs> it's probably a pretty good plan. Um, okay, Phil. So, I I think what we're seeing tonight is that people don't get involved until there's something actually substantively proposed. Um, what I would like is more involvement, but also I, I don't think it's proper that, you know, we, we get absolutely every issue uh, tied up in a bow and comprehensively as nice as that might be because I think a lot of this does need to be pushed for discussion and I don't think discussion is going to happen, nor do I think it's fair to CRCRC or any committee to wait until we've got every issue before we get the community to start weighing in and giving, up, giving them back feedback and getting into those discussions because they might create something that they think is absolutely perfect, but as we see, there's going to be people in the community that are going to disagree with that. <clears throat> so I do think that perhaps adopting thing in a piecemeal fashion may not be the right thing to do, but I think putting things forward in a piecemeal fashion is absolutely necessary for this process. Um, I, I think it's a good idea that we're taking any, these things up like one major issue at a time because like if this came up along with the 
tree ordinance, for example, and we tried to propose changes to that to save some of the heritage oaks in this city, even in setbacks. You know, that's going to get everyone just as up in arms as this building height, you know, issue does. And so I think <clears throat> if we get more than one of these big issues at a time, it's overwhelming and it's too hard to even get through them and people are going to throw their hands up. I, I think that this I agree with Ms. Brown that having something drafted is a good idea that will spur more discussion. And I um, also um, agree with Mr. McDuffie that people don't do anything until they have to. I'm a trial lawyer, <laughs> and I can tell you that <laughs> until the case is actually set for trial and we're going into pick a jury, that defense never really gets serious about paying attention to trying to resolve the case. And so, you know trials get cases settled and you know if we have something drafted and we put it on the docket through the process here it's a long process <laughs> with the P&Z and, and the multiple hearings that are going to take place and I think it's better that we go forward and get something going I you know I would love to see your proposal Mr. Clinton if you can draft something that, that would define that we could vote to put in or not put into the ordinance but we'll at least get an ordinance framework started but just that definition of the plane that you're going to measure from you know because and as i think about it if you got 40 feet front to back in your lot and i realize the buildable area may not have that much grade difference but even if it has 20 feet grade difference how much height do you end up adding to a house you know on a house that's got 40 foot grade because you're going to have to step it down anyway i mean if you're going to go 35 foot height let's say in the front and then you add, you know, half of the 20-foot uh, grade from front to back. That's a 10-foot height difference. That's a, a lot, you know. And then you start getting up to 45-foot heights again, which in your case doesn't matter because it backs up to a green belt. But I think if we're try, trying to draft a rule that applies, you know, as a, I see a, the ordinance as a starting point, you know, because we have special exception cases. But if you're going to define a rule, I just I don't see how that works like, on the most extreme lot. But anyway, we'd love to see what you come up with. I think there's plenty of time for lots more input if we do vote to go ahead and start drafting something based on these recommendations. Okay. I'll just point out I've never seen a scenario yet in my time on council where we've drafted an ordinance and then made any major changes to it at all, like maybe some tweaks here and there. My point is that anything that I, if it comes out of this tonight, if there's a draft, my guess is that it's gonna look Pretty much the way it comes out here tonight when it gets passed. That's just my opinion. I would say we don't do anything. We send this back, let it sit for another 30 days, and bring it back. I, I, if, if I'm reading right what <laughs> everyone's putting down, I think that's what you're about to get. So um, I promised constituents that I spoke to a robust discussion tonight i did not tell any of you this but i knew i could count on you to deliver <laughs> <laughs> whether i told you about it or not so we have spent uh, well over an hour on on this maybe an hour and a half um is there any action I, i'm not hearing of any action to be taken it sounds like we're going to leave it at crc rc yes ma'am uh the action item from the agenda packet is to recommend the crc recommendations to the city council for consideration for a draft ordinance to come back to the planning and zoning commission what i would move is that we uh, request that a draft ordinance come back to crcrc for a 30-day further consideration and that we ask crcrc that that's what i would do and ask that we get a draft ordinance and ask that crc give that draft ordinance 30 days for consideration and then bring back a recommendation to the planning and zoning commission and to the council so that we 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 are we are encouraging the timely resolution of these issues uh with the <clears throat> actual draft language in mind Okay, so I'm clear on what you recommend, and then I'll recognize you for a motion. But okay. so, um, so I'm clear on what you're so draft, <coughs> so draft a recommend, so draft an ordinance based on this recommendation, which would be what's what's in your packet, and then just have us give that to CRC for consideration, and 
because that doesn't seem so that will be that will not be what I heard earlier, which is to have Mr. Clinton's um, here because he would have to be amending off of that draft. What what I am suggesting is that that draft will give Mr. Clinton a document from which he can, uh, which the CRCRC can consider along with Mr. Clinton's proposal. And we're not putting this all on you. This is for yeah. illustrating <laughs> any, This any, is any, any, anyone or else, anyone else. Anyone else that <laughs> wants to, right. to make a proposal. But uh, in one sense, yes, it is giving some weight to the CRC proposal. But that proposal has been considered and recommended for drafting by PNZ uh, and by the CRCRC, both by, I think both were unanimous votes, or maybe there was one vote, one abstention on PNZ. So we've got a good amount of consensus about that proposal. And what I would suggest is we get that proposal in ordinance language, uh, give another 30 days for the CRCRC to consider it along with any other proposals they might receive. And that way, we're another step along the process to getting a, a final draft ordinance. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. I'm at least I'm a, I'm clear on the instruction. I believe uh, based on what I think you'll you'll move. I have a question but, before then you call for a motion. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, ask your question. I want I want to talk about timelines, but go ahead. That's what my question okay. is about. <laughs> okay. I thought it might be. Okay. Uh, so can you talk uh, timelines and also about logistics of getting a draft and the other draft. question was about if it's going to p does it have to go back to pnz since pnz already voted i thought on this recommendation the ordinance would ultimately have to go back to PNZ. okay mm -hmm. if the recommendation itself changes i would think that would need to go back to pnz but if we're doing a draft ordinance uh, i would just like to be i guess i want some clarification on how soon it needs to be ready for the crcrc because i think staff would be working with a planner and legal like to recommend a couple weeks to get that ordinance drafted um, and to, before getting it to the CRCRC. So that would put, you know, two weeks out before they receive it. If they get it 30 days, is there an expectation that it's back here in May? And if that's the case, I think that might be uh, moving a little fast for staff and planning. Can, may I comment? Yes. My, my impression is that having a, I think it's a good idea to start a draft ordinance to keep the, time frame moving along, okay? But I don't think that CRCRC has to have that draft to meet with Mr. Clinton no. and talk about concepts and proposed alternative definitions of a building plane, you know, base uh, um, for measurement purposes. Mm -hmm. sure. And so I, I don't think that we have to have it drafted for CRCRC. Okay. And, and I don't necessarily even think that it needs to be sent back to CRCRC. I think we should just get it drafted and then send it you know, in the meantime, let CRCRC continue to work, let Mr. Clinton continue to provide input even directly to us as he did with his earlier draft. He can define, write a definition that he likes. And let's send it to us, send it around. Let's all talk about it and consider it while we get this uh, drafting going. Hey, and my only concern with, with this approach is that it, it's, it, sound, it sounds like council might want to, to do something different than the actual recommendation and if that's the case I hate to go through the expense of having it drafted and then have it come back to, to be totally altered uh, I'm happy to do that if that's your direction um, but that is my concern with it Alex is my point it won't materially change Sarah the, I, I'm concerned that. about spending the money to draft an ordinance if we're still not if it's still a moving target right yeah okay good discussion I will recognize you for a motion. Okay. Uh, and well, I have further discussion before Good. I'll make my motion. Fine. And that is that um, the uh, I think it's uh, I I would agree with Mr. Glashin that we should ask those who want to propose alternatives to the CRC proposal to do that within the ne at the next two meetings. Uh, one option would be to then have CRCRC 
uh, vote out a recommendation with any changes that they may want to make and have that go for drafting? Or do you want to have it come back to PNZ and then come back to the council before it goes to, for drafting? You know, in my mind, um, uh, it would help to have actual ordinance language to understand exactly what it is that's being proposed. I think I think that the the um, uh, effort it takes to put a recommendation into draft language is time well spent. Uh, and if that, you know, the most of the concepts are the same, if it that gives you something to tweak against or to modify again, you know, it gives you uh, um, uh, a uh, actual language so that the concepts get clarified when you do that, issues get clarified when you do that, uh, the changes that need to be made to it get clarified when you do that, and so I don't think it's wasted time or wasted money. Okay, I have a question. In my experience in doing a lot of legal legislative drafting. I, I, I agree with you. I have a question. Um, and it's for our council. If we put some legislative intent statement in the ordinance such as at the end of, if say we adopt this the way it's written and then we add a, a paragraph that says <clears throat> the Board of Adjustment is encouraged to consider exceptions and adjustments for lots that have uh, slopes um, or unusual slopes um, and where um, relief from the high limit does not uh, um, cause the house to be uh, looming over the neighbor. Um, something to that effect. Is that, um, have any, is that of any help for, to anybody for any purpose or is it useless? No. no, it's not. It's useless because Board of Adjustment has autonomy to do what they want. Correct. It's a quasi-judicial body and then the state law dictates what a hardship is and so they have to go through those, those okay. hardship equations. And would a slope qualify as a hardship under the BOA state guidelines? I think it's going to depend on the facts. The, the law says essentially, and I'm paraphrasing here, that there has, to be, there, there has to be some un, something unique to that piece of property um, which creates a hardship for them to be able to do what they want to do. Um, and so I could see how a piece of property that's got a high slope may may create that hardship, and it has may create that hardship that would authorize a variance under the under the law. So yes, now there of course, you know you're all to some extent you're rolling the dice when you go to the zoning board of adjustment because they have to pr the, the applicant does have the burden of proof on the hardship, so they've got to come with their facts and evidence to support what it is that they want to do. Because if the facts and the evidence don't support, well, the facts are the facts, but they do need to bring the appropriate evidence to support what it is that they want to do. Now, having said that, there may be some room for, well, two, two approaches. One, you've already talked about briefly, which is you could put exceptions to the requirements for things that back up against non-residential lots or and exactly. so you can you can absolutely put that in the ordinance. They wouldn't have to go to the zoning board of adjustment, you, so long as you put s the specifics with respect to what the, when those exceptions apply and what the regulations are. You can absolutely do that. And another option is to create what's called a special exception, and you would have to create some um, regulatory language structure, such as maybe what you've talked about just a moment ago, for purposes of a special exception, which would <coughs> allow somebody. <coughs> Which, and the burden is not nearly as great to get a special exception. Than it and is and who grants the special exception? The Zoning Board of Adjustment. Okay. So we put that in, and then instead of going, so it's the same board of, Zoning Board of Adjustment, but it's a special exception instead of a hardship. Instead of a variance, which requires a hardship. Yes. Okay. So that seems to me like what we would li I would like to see drafted is the ordinance that we have recommended and um, add a... Um, process for a special exception from the Board of Adjustment for lots that have um, unusual slope characteristics. Is that feasible to draft something I like think that? It is feasible. I, we, you know, from a legal standpoint, it's very feasible. The, the, of course, the devil's always in the details with respect <laughs> to the regulatory process or the regulatory 
uh, structure of that, and which is where the <coughs> CRC and the experts mm -hmm. would come in to help with that language and w that policy consideration. Would that also, Councilor, need to go, the draft of that would need to go back to planning and zoning? Yes. All, all of this will have to go back to planning and zoning. Yes, it will. Uh, and this P and Z meeting, piece also. meeting during yes. the summer months? We've invited, we, I think they will be because they're going to have, we, we've, we've tried to make sure for this next year, for this summer, that they're going to be around in a quorum so we can get the commercial comprehensive plan finished, commercial code finished. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <coughs> yeah. we, and we, I another question. One, and I do have one other oh. person that wants to testify, but for a motion. Go ahead. Did you have a question? I had a question. Okay. I, can, I, can, I don't need to make my, I don't need to make <laughs> the comment I was thinking about. Okay. okay. I had another question. You were, uh, Mr. Zach, you were saying something about the devils in the details, and you mentioned something about P and Z and BOA's expertise or something, and I was a little confused when you were talking about the feasibility of drafting a special exception provision into the, the ordinance that we're proposing. So the, the difference between a variance and a special, well, the variance is you know that you have to prove a hardship, and state law spells out what it is that you have to do to prove that hardship, and it's a very subjective analysis. Right. Whereas the, spe the special exception regulatory structure is, is not going to be that same type of subjective analysis. There will be a, it may be somewhat subjective, but it will be on a different set of criteria that where you have, sp yes ma'am. Oh, uh, when you're through, I just was thinking of an example. Oh, sure. No, please. And maybe, maybe your example is a. Well, for example. It, it would be a special exception to the 35 foot height limit or the measurement of the the bottom level of the plane can be granted when there's a slope in excess Perfect. of uh, X feet. Yes. The lot does not adjoin another residential property or the adjoining property is not more than X feet below the plane so that you can have that's what I'm thinking it yes, would look I, like. I, I agree with you. That the perfect example. Uh, that's what you're kind of looking for. And that's why I like, I don't know what those policy considerations need to be, which is why we would need the input from the CRC. So CRCC. You can say a special <laughs> exception can be granted in a case of a lot that has an, an, an unusual slope and where the exception would not adversely impact the adjoining property owner. Yeah, something, something like, like that. Something like that. Mm -hmm. I do not want to try to, you know, uh, um, draft, uh, draft it on the dais, no, but <laughs> <laughs> or give, or give, you know. I understand, but I was trying to figure out part of what your reluctance seemed to be that it's a policy question as to. How it really is. It really is. And so you don't yeah. want to draft it. You want to hear from the policymakers. As yes. To what, the policy what the policy exception should be. Yes, sir. Okay. And so I was just throwing Kevin, out as a policy one of. Kevin, your mi 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 microphone. Microphone. Sorry. It's okay. Just throwing something out as a policy yeah. suggestion for our policy team here. And so I think that the answer lies somewhere within the two things that were just stated. On okay. The Thank you. That's very helpful. Okay. And I think the policy needs to be a lot more specific than what you said. Because that, who gets to decide? There, we can find a happy PNC medium. Or yeah. Or BOA gets to decide, right? No, but when you say difficult or substantial or and, and you know. I say within X feet and so much percentage there's some right. th there, there's a happy medium between yeah. those parameters right. there's some wiggle room in between the two statements yes yeah. right, right. Okay. you just have to make sure that it's something that that is more concrete clear yeah um, okay I'm gonna uh, I will make one recommendation for someone who wants to testify and then I'll open the floor for any motions um, Recognize the Honorable Mr. Farrell. I was told that you wanted to testify again. Oh, no, I suspect that uh, one of the things that uh, we ever, whenever we're gonna make a change in rolling wood uh, on our ordinances, it needs to be done on a very slow, deliberate basis. And if there's still a lot of our citizens that have questions that about this, 
then I think it should go back to our committee first before you start uh, drafting a ordinance on that because there may end up some changes and especially if we're looking at specifics at uh, where we're going to be coming in on a special exception. Okay. All right. Thank you, Tom. I uh, appreciate it. Uh, with that, I will open the floor to any motions. Um, let me give me a moment here. Okay. I move to just postpone this until uh, next meeting. Move to uh, basically move this to CRC to have them take a look at it again with no drafting of uh, any ordinance. All right. Do you have a motion? Is there a second? I need to have that motion stated again. I didn't. It was to, to postpone, uh, postpone. Well, I'll let you state it. State yeah, motion. my motion is to send this back to the CRCRC to review again and not take any action on drafting, starting the drafting of an ordinance at this time. All right, that's the motion. Is there a second? We're, I don't have a second yeah. yet, so we're not going to clarify. And, and I was going to ask for if I could ask for a clarification wait, or the, even offer a friendly second. amendment. The, the motion is open for a second. Second. You, now, now we can do all kinds of talking and clarifying. Okay. <laughs> okay. You have a motion by Mr. Robinson. You have a second by Ms. Hudson. Well, first recognize the council, uh, Councilman Lushing. I, I just wanted to offer a friendly amendment that if we're going to send it back to CR, CRC to give them some direction, which I would propose the direction be that they look at drafting a, um, I'll consider it a, a, special. A, a special exception considerations that, or, or, or a uh, special, drafting a special exception and defining the circumstances under which it would be available for certain lots. Do you accept that? that? Sure, yes. Well, how can we do that? Hold, hold on, I don't, I've, I've got, <laughs> just one second, <laughs> I've got, a motion. Would you like to amend your motion to include the language that Mr. Glasheen just said? Yes. We've got a, an amended motion. Do I have a second? Yes. You have amended motion. Now we can. Uh, now we have. I will recognize first council, and then I'll have. Glad to recognize anyone from the audience to come up to the podium and ask any specific questions. <coughs> council, do you have any questions about the motion and the second? Yes, ma'am. Um, I could support the motion if we have a time certain for it to come back to the council. Okay. Anything else, council? And and the reason uh, the reason I would suggest that is so that we keep attention on this and we mm. we get the people who are concerned about it to appear for CRCRC and make their uh, proposals there so that we can move forward on this issue. Okay, I'll let I'll let the, the the movers and the seconders ponder that question for a moment. Yeah, okay. um, happy to recognize you for a question on the motion. Yeah, Jeff Marks on the <coughs> CRCRC. Um, I would really appreciate if we're going to send anything back that folks can show up to our meetings. Like, I think it'd be really helpful to move this along if council members came to the meetings, members from PNZ, members from the community, folks who didn't know. Um, I can do more to alert people to when the meetings are happening, but there has to be a forum to move this conversation forward. We keep, like, this isn't the first time that stuff's been sent to council, stuff's come back, back and forth. Now people in the community are saying this is the first time we've heard of it. <laughs> so I just want to say, I've, this is, process has started over a year ago. Uh, I've been coming to these meetings, try to come when I can, got four kids, trying the best I can to show up to the meetings. It's really hard. I admire the heck out of the amount of work that Alex has put into this, Dave's put into this, all the members, Brian. It's a lot of time and effort that's gone into this up until this point. I totally agree we want everyone's input, but people have to show up to the meetings. And no one's been coming to the meetings, and we, ha we have to figure out a way to move this forward. Thank you. Jeff. Thank you. And we, we do understand that. <laughs> we <laughs> that sympathize. We sympathize with that issue. Um, I do appreciate your work on everyone's work on the CRCRC. Um, okay, Council, any other items? Alex, did you have for those comments yeah, I, similar? I think, yeah, I, I echo Jeff's comments. Like, we kind of interpreted 
this process to be exactly what is here that we bring this to you guys we don't have the legal expertise we don't know how to draft these things we bring you a set of recommendations and and then you guys run it through your machine and so yeah i do think we need to know exactly what it is that you think that we're going to produce that's different potentially that would be helpful okay. so thank you Alan. yeah my Alan. comment on that is that my phone blew up today and that tells me that people are just now hearing about this and learning about it and they deserve more time to think about it so that that or deserve more time to think about what's being proposed and if they have any comments that's what the advantage of like having you guys just take this off another 30 days i don't understand what the rush is um you can then, then we can get some more feedback on this possibly maybe no one will show up it's true probably i can't force other residents to show up but i can tell you that we received tons of emails from citizens and residents about this today and I just think it's wise to like have have give them another you know thirty days to give some feedback on it. That's all. Okay. All right. Thank <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you everyone. Um, okay, we're on the we're on a rocky glide path to landing here, but um, Mr. Glashine. Thank you. I, I agree. It's a good idea to get back to see our CRC just to give the public who is excited about this, some time to have some input onto it. Uh, it's not going to pass tonight, it appears anyway. Um, although I, I think it's a good recommendation. I like the recommendations you, you guys made. If it were up for tonight, I would vote for it, but for one thing, and that is I learned something new tonight, um, and that is that it's really hard to go to Board of Adjustment and get an exception under hardship rules unless we write a um, variance, is that what it was called? No, special. special. The opposite, yes, yeah, it's, it's hard to get a variance, but if you write a special exception Thank with you. appropriate that's, criteria. That's what I learned tonight, and I, I think it'd be smart to write a variance into the ordinance. I special don't special 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 I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> all right. If you, vote, you can, yeah, if you vote, you can stop having to say it. <laughs> and to sort of just, I don't know if this will help crystallize the difference, but you know, a variance is supposed to only be granted when there is something really unique with the property and your zoning ordinance just doesn't fit with that particular piece of property. Whereas a special exception is quite honestly quite the example quite eloquently stated by Councilmember Brown is where you create criteria that everybody is comfortable with that meets the goals and objectives of the community and can be granted as a special exception um, to the zoning ordinance uh, based on that specific set of criteria. Thank you. That was helpful. And, and Personally, I don't think that it's going to be feasible to write a special exception criteria that is as detailed as some of the council members want, but I still think we need to have a special exception. And you guys have a lot of expertise in this area and can word, you know, just word something. It doesn't have to be legal. Once you get it back to us, we can run it through the legal process and put, like you said, put it into the machine to turn it into law. But I think that the, the terms of the special exception considerations should just be common sense and stated in ordinary plain language. And, to, and it be as objective as possible given the concerns of the other council members. Okay, uh, thank you, count, Councilman. Um, so you do, yes, sir. And this allows those citizens who think they've got a unique case with their lot to come forward to CRCRC and say, I would like to be considered for this special exception because of these circumstances with my lot. And if people fail to do that, then you get what you get. Okay. All right, you have a motion and a second. Uh, you have amended motion and a second. Is there further amendment to the motion? I recognize. A move that we add um, that this comes back to council for um, evaluation in June. Second. At the June meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. I accept. You accept? Okay. So we've got. <laughs> An amended amendment to the motion <laughs> um, and you have a second so that's the motion and and 
that's not all that parliamentary that I just did, but am I okay <laughs> back here with my city secretary? Is that good enough? Okay. <laughs> all right. Somebody besides me needs to second that. Hey. Well, he, oh. he, oh, he, accepted? he accepted it, he accepted. and you okay. re-seconded. Yes, okay. it's, it's, it's loose. It's in the ballpark. But as long as my city secretary is clear on the motion and who made it and who seconded, okay, I get in the head shape. Okay, with that, further discussion, council? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Being five ayes, no nays, motion carries. Thank you, council, and thank you for everyone. <laughs> who participated in this evening. Um, moving on to agenda item number 14, discussion of possible action on an ordinance formalizing the process for address changes. Um, and I will recognize Ms. Wayman for this explanation. Okay, so in the past, um, address changes have been handled a couple different ways, at least that, that I've seen. Um, but for the most part, they always include city council approval uh, and normally it's just in the form of a letter from an applicant to the city council. We have recently had somebody inquire about an address change and realize that we have nothing in our code that talks about a process for an address change. And so what we have done in this ordinance is try to capture um, for the most part what's been done in the past but to put a little bit of um, boundaries around it, put an application so that way we at least have some similar information being collected from each applicant. Um, and that's what's before you in the form of an ordinance today. Um, I will say I, I know that there has also been concern and questions about what this means for the orientation of a home as far as what's the front yard for purposes of setbacks. Um, we did not just address that in this section because that is in the zoning code. So that is in section 107 currently. Um, if that were in this ordinance, it wouldn't be something you could act on without it going through the Planning and Zoning Commission. So I think we'd be happy to discuss that section as well and get any direction for uh, what to do with that in the future or to bring it back. But this just simply puts a process to the actual request for an address change that comes to City Council. And we don't have any of these pending right now, but as Ashley said, we, we have had an inquiry and that's when it came to our attention that we don't really have anywhere to point anyone to, so that's what's. This, this is actually something that I thought that the CRCRC needed to evaluate um, because I think it is something that we need to address in the code. Yeah. Uh, to me, it's more than just a procedure. It is also, um, I think that we need to provide public notice to surrounding neighbors before a, a address change is allowed because it does change the setbacks. Um, and also, I think that we need to require that the, the, the front of the house match the address. Because yeah. we have had a number of cases, or, or all, of, all of the changes that I can think of where we have had an address change, the people changed the address but they didn't change the orientation of the house, they just changed the setbacks. Um, and so that the, the front door is not on, is, doesn't match the address, right? The front door is on the other street. Oh, they and kept it from the old spot, the original location you're saying. They yeah, the, they, they, they build a house and the front door matches where the, ho where the address used to be, but, but they changed the address so that they can change the setbacks. And so that impacts the neighbors, so that's why I think they need to have the, the public notice because, you know, if you had a 20-foot setback and now all of a sudden they're changing it so it's only a 10-foot setback, the neighbors lose some privacy and so they should be notified. And, and I think it's a problem from um, first responders and delivery people and the post office and everybody else when when the address doesn't match where the where the front of the house is yeah yeah and all of those issues are what Ashley mentioned that uh, that are in that other code in, in chapter 107 and, and we're happy to happy to bring that back um, this is just taking sort of the baby step of formalizing the process but I, I think you're probably right on the on the larger issue over in 107 and we're happy to let CRCRC do it or however you, or have us bring it back, however you want to accomplish that. Um, up to you and fine with us. Um, 
if we could go ahead and take this first baby step, that would be great. Okay, well, <coughs> I don't think it's a controversial issue. To it's the really thing, the things the things that, the things that, I, that, that are I mentioned yes, that don't seem controversial to me. So I don't know that we need to add, add to the burden of the CRCRC because I think they have other more important things to address. So. Um, I mean, to be candid with you, we actually had an earlier version that did some of what you're talking about, but uh, it occurred to us that that would have to go through a different process, so we okay. pared it down to just this part of it. So. Did I cover that one? Yeah. Um, okay. Yes, ma'am. Why can't we just ask that the two additional criteria Sarah mentioned be added and it be brought back to us? your answer part of that may be also uh, legal if it can go in this section so currently in section 107 <coughs> and in another section which that's a zoning section so it would have to go through the planning and zoning commission before and a public hearing process before it's changed is where it deals with front yard which way it faces who determines right. that All and right. so I think what councilmember Brown correct me if I'm wrong councilmember Brown I think what she was asking is can the council give direction to staff and myself to to bring back a, an ordinance to go through that process now? And I think the answer is yes. If you want to give that direction, you can you can do that, and then we could run it through the process. Okay. For question, Sarah would like to add two criteria: that the front of the house must match the address before a change can be made, and that. Uh, there be public notice to adjacent properties. Not not before that the change can be made. That that the that the change. Yes, the the front of the house must match the address. So, as as it's built. So well, the whole, I'm sorry. Here's what I'm asking. If we if you look at the current subsection A, the application must be submitted, and it must have one, two, three, four. Do we add five um, uh, demonstrate the, that the, the address will match the front of the house? There's a better way to say that. Six, um, uh, or maybe it's under, maybe it's not a six, maybe it's under 101-288-C, provide applicant must provide public notice to all adjacent properties. Would that require it to go to zoning? And Would require it to go through zoning? Let me take that. Okay. So so tho those changes that she's suggesting, w suggesting would need to occur in 107.75 in the zoning ordinance? And there's some other cleanup that we would probably do at that same time, and that's what triggers the, the more the fuller process of going to planning and zoning. What is 10775? Yards generally. <laughs> I didn't name it. Well, what other changes? Can't we deal with the, the, the change of address? Before, so without cur currently 10775C reads, the building official shall determine the street address and thus the front yard for each corner lot. We'd like, we would sort of like to get out of that business mm -hmm. and um, and that hits at the heart of what Sarah's talking about. Well, that that's a simple strike subsection C. It is, but Except it will. It does have to go through the PNZ process. Well, yeah. that I would agree there. But can we do what Sarah wants to do in 101, 287? I'll let the counselor speak to that. That's the way we first had it drafted, and I think they determined that it would be better in 107. I'd, I'd like to comment on this if I could. It addresses your issue, and, and that is that the way it's drafted now, we don't have to go to PNZ to make this change, and it lets council, essentially, as I read it, have discretion on whether to grant someone an address change. So if somebody comes and asks for it, they have to get council approval for every address change. So if somebody comes and asks for a change, we don't have to approve it unless it meets the criteria that you guys have just set forth, which is that the address matches the front of the house, for example. That was going to be my point, is that because this comes to city council, you can, abs without even putting that in here, you as the body,
can say, no, we're not going to grant this address change unless. It and notice to the neighbors as well. We could say we can add notice planning. to the neighbors for sure. Um, That's easy. Uh, that is true, but <laughs> also it gives an applicant and Nikki the ability to say, you can't do this unless the address matches the front of the house. You know, it, it, it's else, good so. notice, but yeah, I understand the point. I understand the point, but I, th I think. It's just nice to be able to get something passed and not have to go through P and G process. You know, because that's going to take a while. Well, if we get something passed, then they have a procedure to follow. And if we are all clear that these are the things that council is going to expect when it comes, then Nikki can tell people this is what they're going to make you do. Well, so. I, I think we can fix this because the the required document documentation we can put a criteria in there that uh, state whether or not the uh, address corresponds to the orientation of the front of the house. And that's part of the documentation that must be presented when it comes to council. Yeah, we could do that. Yeah. The only thing I was thinking through is, and I don't, and this may not be an issue, but if, if someone comes in and because they want to re-address, it's going to be, it's going to be a re-address, right? They're going to, they want to re-address their house from the, this street to this street. And there's a, there's a house existing and they're going to tear that house down and rebuild it. Yeah. Having a requirement in here, I don't know is enforceable in our zoning regulations, which is where this is appropriate right. for purposes of our yeah. setbacks. But I, I don't know that anybody is going to readdress a house unless they're tearing it down right. and building a new house. Yeah, and so that kind of, it's kind of putting the almost the right. cart before the horse, I think. Right, maybe. because they give, they do the readdress before they even turn in a building permit. Well, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. let's so. have it let's have it drafted with the zoning code, and that'll give the P and Z the ability to take both the amenities ordinance and this ordinance to a public hearing, and we can move forward. Sure, we can absolutely do that, and. We can adopt this though for the process and procedures so that at least we get it in place and we force people to come to y'all in yeah. the interim. Okay. Yes. That works. And, and That's uh, a good idea. And the other issues are to be addressed in 107-75. Yeah, and we have, we have, I think we have clear direction on what we want accomplished in that. So. Okay. So I move adoption of ordinance number 2024-04-17-14 as currently drafted. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion by Mr. Duffy, a second by Ms. Brown. Is there further discussion? Do we need to add anything to bring back the code I'm going to come back on that we if you all want to. to. We don't have to. I, I, I mean, I'm comfortable with what I've heard unless you want to okay. make a more, unless y'all need a more formal. We don't, um, okay. just, I'll come back to that. So all those okay. in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. I think five ayes, no nays, motion carries. Thank you, council. And as long as uh, staff has noted that we want to bring this back, the, the rest of the, the rest of the story. Yes. Are we good? Okay. Okay, we will do that. Okay, moving on to agenda item number 15. Uh, discussion and possible action on a letter of support to the Texas Water Development Board regarding the scoring metric for financial assistance programs. So um, I've put, placed this on the agenda for your consideration, Council, just because I want your guidance. I think it's a good idea. We uh, have a friend who serves on Council at Lago Vista. Um, he's a former legislative staffer and seems to be doing a great job for his community. Um, he's, he has approached a number of communities like our, like ours, um, and theirs that have, um, they're in a little bit different area, a little different situation. They have a high growth rate, a high, um, uh, so they're facing some different challenges, but there are similar challenges, um, and that they are, they certainly are not going to meet some of the criteria that tip, uh, typically is, um, evaluated by the Water Development Board when you're applying for for these funds. Um, and I think it does make sense if you're in a high growth area or a high development area 
uh, but you may not. We have certain constraints, obviously, that um, are placed on us to be able to go to Water Development Board and borrow, you know, cheap money and be able to do some projects. Um, and so we really get cut out a lot uh, out of a lot of those uh, funding opportunities, grant opportunities. Um, and revolving loan opportunities at the Water Development Board because of the type of community that we're in and, and they're in. Um, so I think there's some merit. I, I wanted to get your take on it, Council, to see if you're interested in us jumping in on this. Um, I'm happy to you know, work on a letter. I think the one that's in your packet has a Lago Vista letterhead. I would suggest that we do some sort of joint letterhead. He's got some other communities that I think are gonna sign on to it. Ms. Brown had some good, and I'd like you to speak to some of the um, changes that you would recommend to the letter. I have some too. One is um, just the nature of our budgeting process now and the caps that are placed on communities. I mean, we have limited ability to raise matching funds locally uh, within our tax structure, um, and I think some sort of reference to that would also maybe be something that I would suggest he add. Um, and I don't know what the other communities that he may have signed on to it might, <coughs> might want to change up as well. I, if you give me your permission, I'll work with them and we'll come up with something that sounds decent and kind of is an agreed to uh, version of that letter among several different, whatever communities he has to sign on to it. I, I told him I thought it was a good idea, but that we typically, um, I, I seek guidance and um, permission from council before I would just sign on to it as mayor of Burlington. That's why it's before you. You had some questions, or you had some comments. Uh, well, um, Mr. Mayor, I think it's a good idea, and I think it's a good idea uh, to to do this and to do it in collaboration with other smaller communities. Uh, some of the wording in this letter, uh, numerous large-scale infrastructure projects. Right. I'm not sure that fits Rolling Wood. It doesn't. Yeah. But if the impact of these regulations is that Rolling Wood would not be able to uh, qualify for um, this kind of, I guess it's like state-backed bond funds, then it would impact, um, could impact financing costs and uh, jeopardize the feasibility of water projects, something to that effect. I think that's good. Um, I'm also, just now recalling that um, John Hinton, who was in the bond business for quite a while, has advised that these, these Water Development Board bonds don't actually make monetary sense the way they're structured currently for smaller cities because you can't, uh, there's some, I, I've forgotten the exact details there, but that might be uh, a, uh, a comment to add as well. I've forgotten whether it's the minimums or the, um, there's something about these bonds that doesn't work for small cities. Yes, especially <coughs> well-to-do small cities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I remember you telling us when, when uh, our, our water bond issue came up, I asked about water development mm -hmm. board and you basically said forget it, we're never getting any water. And this is basically, this is what that's trying to mm -hmm. sort of address to ask them to sort of take some special some special exceptions um, into account in some circumstances um, well, we might we might add a safety criteria right. for small cities because a lot of times these grants too are all you know, especially federal grants but also state grants they'll have a matching component to it so they may say yeah we'll loan you ten million dollars but you have to you know you have to pony up a million mm -hmm. okay well if, if I came to you and said, hey, we have an opportunity to go get 10, but we have to put up a million of local match, we, we have no ability, like we would literally have to go out for a bond with, because we don't have those dollars to be able to, to provide our local match. So mm -hmm. that's an extreme example, but that's the, that's the type of, situ we are hamstrung with, so even if in their budgeting process we decided, hey, we wanna try to set aside some dollars for this local match, well, we can't because we'd be busting the three and a half percent cap. Right. So, so we need them to take into some special considerations for smaller cities. And I don't know what that would look like at the end of the day. And I honestly think that they're probably, it, it, we may have to try this for a number of years before they actually take it seriously. But 
we, we might put in something to the effect of when a smaller city has a piece part of a larger project, I'm thinking the bridge across Eames Creek uh, or drainage along Mopac, then we need to be able, if, if we're going to participate in that project, we need to be able to have the kind of resources that would allow us to do that, do something. Right. And maybe <clears throat> some kind of exception for smaller cities without regard to wealth where the issue is a major one of safety consideration right. or, some, right. something or something like that. Something to, to the benefit of the mission of the Water Development Board or you know, yeah. whatever that may be. Yeah. So if, if you're good, um, is this posted? This is posted for action. Ha happy to, I, I probably do need action from you. If you want me to pursue something like this, I'm happy to go work with um, Laga Vista, work with whatever communities, work with uh, Council Member Som, and uh, try to come up with something if you give me permission to do so. Yes, ma'am. I would move that the Council authorize the Mayor to uh, work jointly with uh, Lago Vista and other similar cities with regard to comments regarding the implementation of the Texas Water Fund in the matter that we've discussed this evening. Do you have a motion? Is there a second? Second. We have a motion by Ms. Brown and a second by Ms. Hudson. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. I think five eyes, no nays, motion carries. Thank you, Council. I'll work on that. Uh, moving on to agenda item number 16, discussion of possible action on a proposed local amendment to the International Building Code to require issuance of a certificate of op occupancy for a change in owner, tenant, or business name. This one's a really straightforward uh, one, and I appreciate count, or appreciate staff bringing this to our attention, both Nikki and Ashley. If uh, I'll recognize Ms. Wayman to explain the issue. Sure. So this actually was something that uh, Nikki had noted on her list of things we would like to change uh, or to, to bring into effect soon. Um, so we currently have no requirement that for a change of tenant in a commercial district um, or the commercial area, rather, out, you know, outside of residential, which doesn't, this doesn't quite apply, but that they would get a certificate of occupancy. And so um, what that doesn't allow us to do is we don't know for sure that the use is compatible. So um, for example, we've had restaurants change in and out before they've come to get um, a certificate of occupancy and we may not find out until they've uh, come to get a sign permit or we're like, hey, you're a restaurant and you know, you would have to get a special use permit. And so things like that, we just aren't able to check on those things. There's also some life health safety um, inspections that go along with that as they do <coughs> their interior work. And if they're not um, doing the amount of work that requires like a full tenant finish out permit, we aren't finding out about it. And so this would just simply put in that requirement that they have to come get a certificate of occupancy from us. Um, this would be an amendment to the International Building Code, so we do need to do a public hearing at the City Council level. Um, so if this is something that the Council agrees with and is okay with the draft amendment, we would bring that back um, to you next month along with any other, uh, I, I don't know that we would need a fee schedule amendment because I believe we already have a certificate of occupancy fee in our code, so I don't think we would need anything. We don't, we don't currently have one. Okay, we would need to bring that back. We may have a residential one, it might be what I'm thinking about. Um, but anyways, we, we will draft the, requ the required information and bring that back to you next month. But just wanted to um, make sure it was something the council agreed with. So what do you need from them this evening? Um, honestly, I don't even know that we really need action. Um, if, if everyone is just in general agreement, we can bring this back next month on consent and or regular agenda if there's a lot to consider. This seems Alec. like a hey, go ahead. good idea because I would say a change in tenant could potentially change the um, the wastewater mm -hmm. charge right. for a facility. You sure. know, different operation is going to have a different level of wastewater usage, and that needs to be accounted for. <coughs> right. They, it's good for the operation. building owners too to give kind of put them on notice. <coughs> but don't get a don't get ahead of yourself yeah. before you rent your space out. So Alec, you have a question? Yeah, no, I was just trying to think through. So if I bought a building or small, then I can't use it for anything until I come to the No, it would just be for the tenants, right? I mean, unless you're changing, the owner. if you're changing the- Or the owner, right, too, I guess. Yeah. But you would have to be changing from what's there currently. Yeah, if like I said, I bought a building, I just want to use it in my office. I don't know if there are any scenarios like that. It's like a small little office that I bought. Mm -hmm. I have to 
it, go through this. Yes, you would. Yeah. Yep. Because we would have no idea, you know, what you're using it for if we don't know you're there. So if we don't know it's changed hands, we wouldn't know. We don't know what kind of office <laughs> you're yeah. gonna have. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it sounds like you'll have. And and if there's <laughs> if there's no um, you know if there's no major changes happening if there's no you know interior re I mean it would be I mean just a check of a box like you know, that so yes we know you're here a, you know it'd be very simple at that point if there was no major changes happening inside the building. Yeah, but like we don't do that in residential. I buy a house. I don't have to get a, a buy a house from somebody. I don't have to. That's anyway, true, but you do have to, co yeah, you came in and change, you know, change the water, changes. water service, water yeah. service, because that doesn't yeah. always happen for tenants in a commercial mm. building, because often, sometimes it'll just go, they have one combined yeah. account, so. so I mean, this is a common thing, it's a pretty common yeah. mm -hmm. thing to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just commercial, right? Just commercial. Mm -hmm. This would be an amendment to the International Building Code, so it would only apply to commercial. I, I think it makes sense. Mm -hmm. And we have run into this problem, too. Where yeah. We're like, oh, oh, this is now a restaurant. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, okay, that's not gonna be hard to figure out which one it was on. But. Yeah, <laughs> don't have that many of those, but yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm good with it. Motion. Okay, you need a motion. Go for it. Yeah, if you would. We're oh, just, we're okay oh, with that. You're good one. with that one. Everyone's okay. I love it. A thumbs up. Even better. We will take a thumbs up. And we will move on to agenda item number 17, where we have some marginally better news, but not the best. Uh, number 17, update on the status of the Rollingwood trademark applications. Ms. Wayman. We are in the top 25. Yay. Excellent. Woo! Fantastic. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So. so there you have it. There's your countdown. Um, sure. Thank you, Shanti. And with that, I'll accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. No. Five ayes. <laughs> Four. <laughs>